Hey, Vosh. Howdy. Hey, man. How's it going? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Good, good. So am I on video or audio? You're just Should audio right now. Sorry, I, I just got reminded that we have a bit of lag. So sometimes when I end my sentence, I don't really hear what you're saying. And I think uh, listening at, <laughs> at what happened last time, I realized that we should probably give each other a little bit of buffer. Um, so I'm just going to say if it's OK with you, uh, just give me like up to a minute to answer whatever you're saying, and I'll do the same. And hopefully that will be good. Well, I don't like doing very concrete blocks of back and forth, because I find that oftentimes when that happens, you never actually address any of the points. Or one person will make 17, and then one person gets the chance to offer, like, a rebuttal to maybe two. Um, but I'll try my best not to interrupt, because the delay is unfortunate, and, it, you know, obviously you don't want to completely talk over each other. Either way, um, yeah, I've, I've got a clear hour. I, I'm sorry about the um, hasty change in stream schedule. You know, Brazilian January 6th took place just a little bit ago, and uh, I, I, I rolled out of bed for that, and the stream got pushed earlier. Totally, totally understand. You know, a lot of stuff has been happening in the world. It's been kind of crazy. Uh, Sri Lanka ran out of fuel. <laughs> Cars uh, definitely not, uh, you know, weren't moving earlier this year. Haiti has an energy crisis and a lot of uh, unrest. So to see this, you know, the, in Peru, the president had uh, basically pulled the Yeltsin against the, 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 you know, the Congress, got arrested. So things are pretty crazy around the world. Yeah, so uh, I understand. Yeah, I'd say so. So what's on your mind? I wanted to call in and just kind of have a calm, rational conversation um, where I kind of talk about a libertarian perspective. And I realized last time it would just went all over the place. I would like to sort of um, propose that it's a valuable way to look at things, um, to sort of step back from uh, people's nationalities or religions or membership in a specific country, or try to anthropomorphize countries and say, well, this country did this as if, you know, somebody stole something from that person and sort of maybe divide people by, in, in a different way, divide people into regular civilians who may not necessarily want to kill each other, regardless of which religion or nationality they may be, and their political leaders, armies, top-down media, education system, and so on, which are systems which, in my opinion, have uh, outsized effects on these individuals and ultimately uh, create conditions which are hard to reverse, wars, conflicts, famines, and so on. Um, and so I think we need to be mindful of how these systems work and see if maybe we can continue to improve systems just like we've been doing over the last few hundred years. That's basically what I want to talk about today. Oh, works fine to me. So, prescriptively then, I remember we had a number of disagreements vis-a-vis -vis the um, support of the war in Ukraine and everything. What do you disagree with me on? What positions do I have you don't get along with? It's a good question. Um, I guess we can go into that and then I want to talk more broadly. I want to hear your positions, right? I want to know what your position is in general for solving conflicts and problems. But when it comes to the war in Ukraine, um, I'm curious about one thing. So I've heard you say a lot about uh, sort of you're against fascists, right? And you believe that the United States is full of fascist adjacent people or perhaps fascists themselves. Yes. Uh, can you kind of tell me a little bit about that? What is your viewpoint in general? Like, what, where, do you, where are you coming from? Well, the Republican Party at this point is a pretty overtly fascist organization. Whether you're talking about it being anti-democracy in the sense that it's supported, funded, continues to play cover for a coup, undermines democratic um, norms and institutions, you know, the reactionary side of things, hyper-militarism, xenophobia, pulling away from the world. On basically every box you can tick, they're fascist. Um, which is not good, because fascism is bad. So, gotta work on that. And by work on that, do you advocate some form of violence or how do you plan to actually overcome the growing fascism uh, in the United States? Violence itself doesn't do anything. The most you can do is get people to not be fascist and to preserve our democratic institutions. If fascists try another coup or if there are people who are trying to kill our elected representatives, I think violence is a pretty acceptable measure of self-defense against those specific people. 
But for the millions and millions of Americans who just casually happen to believe really stupid shit, um, that ain't gonna cut it. The most you can do, really, is try to construct systems that encourages them to think better things. Okay, but what about actual um, people that hold really right-wing nationalist uh, beliefs like the Tiki Torches and, uh, you know, the Unite the Right rally? Uh, some of the people who went to January 6th might fall into that category. What do you do with Spencer, neo-Nazis, I don't know, whatever, in this country? Freedom of speech. They've got the right to feel that way, even if it's stupid. Um, but people like those, they don't come out of nowhere. They exist because there are other systems and incentive structures that construct them, you know. Uh, there weren't randomly a bunch of, like, white supremacist neo-Nazis in, in, like, you know, um, 1300s China. This, this stuff emerges from material conditions we have control over. And so I want to construct conditions that keep people like that from believing those things. I like that. I think the more we talk, the more we're going to get agreement on the fact that the systems shape how people think, feel, and so on, okay? And through that lens, I mean, Ukraine is one specific case, and everyone right now is concerned about it, and rightly so. You know, people are dying, and I think we all want less people to die. Okay. Uh, I keep saying, you know, and the Pope uh, and others on the left say that, well, we have to stop the war, we have to stop escalating, we have to stop shipping weapons there. And of course, there's disagreement because a lot of people would like to ship more weapons to Ukraine because they want to achieve a broader geopolitical goal, which is to say that perhaps they'll starve Russia of resources, perhaps Russia will never rise again as a, a military superpower. Uh, perhaps um, they'll eliminate all forms of aggression or invasions, which to me is very utopian, but uh, that's been sort of the hope, I think, in arming Ukraine. But at the same time, these bombs, the vast majority of these explosives and rockets explode in Ukraine. So, well, you know... Yeah, Ukraine's yeah. the country being invaded. Obviously, any defensive action would have to be done in the borders of Ukraine. Correct. So I want to point out a few things about the Ukraine war, which are very unique and different than most wars. And, and if I'm wrong, let me know. One of the things is, so as of January, 20, uh, January 2nd, 2023, okay, recently, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights verified, I'm reading here, that a total of basically 7,000 civilian deaths since Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, and out of those, 430 were children. Mm -hmm. Here, and furthermore, 11,000 were injured, reported. Here's my point. In most wars that I have seen, in most conflicts, including in Syria, where the, uh, the opponents were non-state actors, maybe like Al-Nusra Front and, and Free Syrian Army, they say, and so on, um, they raised entire cities. Uh, homes, Aleppo, they're gone. Uh, you look at Grozny in Chechnya, you know, it was the most bombed out city at that time. So Russia is capable of leveling cities, destroying large numbers of people. And in Afghanistan, you know, you had two million dead civilians. So to see, I've never seen a war where there's an order of magnitude now less civilian deaths than fi fighter deaths. And these, it's of course sad, these people are being grabbed off the street, many of them shanghai into joining you know on both sides uh, on russia's side there's sort of maybe an or orderly uh, you know uh, draft and and there's some volunteers that joined earlier but at the end of the day what i'm saying is yes that's sad but we typically tend to look at civilian deaths can you tell me any other war in which less civilians die than combat than combatants and by an order of magnitude even this is like I've never seen this. Well, it's, it's relatively uncommon, but I think it's a product of the fact that we've been able to arm Ukraine to defend itself. If the Ukrainian military rolled over, um, if they were completely unable to defend themselves, then Russia would have been able to sweep across Ukraine, at the very least the river, and um, the resistance against Russia would have taken the form of like civilian uprisings, militia groups and ordinary people uh, raising together the arms to fight against Russia. That would have been very destructive in terms of human life. Um, but in areas that are occupied by Russia, the people there know that they can be calm and wait and not fight because they know that the Ukrainian government will come for them. 
the hope in the government saving them is what's keeping a lot of these civilians from engaging in like stochastic terrorism to uh to defend their homeland sure i'm not talking about uh you know an uprising or a guerrilla warfare of the type that cia wanted to thought they would have to do after russia won in a few days they thought uh what i'm saying is that in most wars the civilians are casualties you know it's called collateral damage by the united states a very uh interesting term uh but the point is that in you know you look at uh, operation cast led by israel in gaza you look at uh, nagorno karabakh uh you know and and so on what i'm trying to say is it seems to me very clearly that there's another explanation too which is that neither the russians nor the ukrainian army uh really want to kill ukrainian civilians and i'll give you one reason for that um 11 million russians have family in Ukraine. These are stories of love. These are stories of people getting married, having children, okay? And these are the stories as a libertarian that I want to focus on. But the media uh, and the politicians and everybody who fails to, you know, come to an agreement with the Minsk agreements and so on, they fail. And then they play up these stories of hate. And of course, there's organic stories of hate now because you may not have hated Russians, but then they kill your brother or you, they kill your mother, and the next thing you know, you hate Russians, like you actually literally hate them. And what I'm trying to say to you is, we need to think systemically, we need to look at publics and populations, because this is not simply a war of one man, Putin, but this is the Russian public and the Ukrainian public being driven to hate each other and being conscripted. And to me, that is how we have the lens through which we have to look at wars and we have to de-escalate these conflicts. But I'm afraid that's definitely not true. First of all, indiscriminate attacks against civilians are literally a part of the Russian military doctrine. If it weren't for the unseasonably warm weather, the Russians' plan of shelling energy infrastructure and then freezing out the Ukrainian population would have succeeded. It was only because of luck and global warming that that didn't happen. But hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians may have frozen to death in their villages were it not for just dumb luck. This was something that was being joked about by people on Russian state television. There are not to mention the Bucha uh, mass graves, the war crimes, the fact that we don't even know the actual number of dead. We only know the reported dead. It's pretty hard to do that during a conflict. Um, and the fact that many children have been stolen and brought into Russia. Um, it's waning population or kind of cultural replacement, I'm not really sure, but it has been noted to happen. Um, this isn't about the Ukrainian and Russian people being told to hate each other. It's about Russia invading. You're framing it like it's some kind of neutral or even like the media is putting these two against each other. They're not. Russia invaded Ukraine. If Ukrainians right now wanted Russians out and wanted the Russian soldiers and their population dead, they would be right. They're being invaded. Um... But if the Russian soldiers in that same position were to say, oh, well, while I'm here, I want the Ukrainian civilians dead, they would be wrong to. They are the aggressors here. Well, yeah, you won't see me defending uh, atrocities in war. Uh, you know, you could go back to Human Rights Watch as a, a side point to 2014 and talk about the Ukrainian aggression against civilians in the Donbass region, talk about cluster munitions, the same type of cluster munitions Which, that the Guardian found to be used in Bucha. Maybe they Russia used... shouldn't have invaded then. I'm not talking about 2022. They I'm invaded saying... in 2014. Okay, we can discuss um, that invasion. Let's discuss that invasion, because you're when you use the word invasion, I sometimes think you're conflating the two... Uh, conflicts right so go ahead tell me what happened in 2014. well after the euromaidan event and yanukovych was ousted by the russian people after he fled of his own accord um killing protesters on the way out um the russian government who had relied on yanukovych to be a stooge they could use to control the ukrainian people decided to use more direct means and so they instead turned towards um Ukrainian, not Russian. Uh, instead, the Russian government, no longer having Yanukovych as a puppet, uh, decided to just full-on prompt a, an invasion. Um, oh. Now, 
rather than doing so directly themselves, they instead armed, funded, supported, trained, and provided munitions to Russian separatists in the Donbass. Um, this is like one of the clearest definitions of a proxy war imaginable. Um, it, it's, it's very literally Russia just like shadow boxing with Ukraine through the Russian separatists. But Russia nonetheless did this. Uh, they were the ones that created the conditions that um, led to the fighting in the Donbass. And they sent special forces over as well. They didn't keep entirely out of it. There were Russian troops found there. So I think it's valuable to go to the beginning of a conflict, go a little bit before and look at, you know, the factors that have led to it, right? We can do that with the Yemen Also war. the annexation of Crimea. Yeah, sorry. And the annexation of Crimea. We can go through each one of these things. Um, so... I don't know which ones to start with because they're all important. Uh, let's start with Crimea, just because I think it's important. That, that specific region is very different than what's happening in the Donbass and, and in the current uh, Ukraine uh, conflict. Crimea, as a region, you know, it changed hands many times, just like with Ukraine. Uh, it belonged to Turkey. I think Catherine the Great, uh, Catherine the Second, whatever, uh, in, of Russia conquered it. Uh, Stalin deported a lot of Crimean Tatars, leaving mostly Russians uh, there, or Russian speakers. Now, two important things about Crimea, and then I want to talk about the larger Ukraine issue. Crimea, in 1954, the United, when, when you know, Ukraine was a socialist republic and so was Russia, they did not feel the type of nationalism that we feel today because they were just part of a federation, just like New Jersey Don't and you think New York. it's kind of weird to introduce all of this as a prelude to an unambiguous armed conquest of a territory? No. I'm, I'm I, trying to explain I, well, I, No, I want to save you time. I don't care. Crimea could well, have been... Okay, so Crimea is, could have been made the, an official part of Ukraine five hours before the annexation, and I would not care. It right, was but that's the not use, the point. It was a military invasion where troops were used to seize and annex a territory. It had nothing to do with democracy. The people did not will it. The governments did not approve of it. It was just a land grab. It was no different from Hitler annexing the Sudetenland. At least when he annexed Austria, he was uh, celebrated as a hero by some Austrians. Um, in this case, the government didn't even like concede anything. The Ukrainian government just had land taken from them. One Additionally, so legally speaking, Russia has already acknowledged the sovereignty of Crimea. This is a done deal legally. We're opening so many uh, cans of worms. I'm trying to close uh, each of the things that you're saying, at least say one thing about them. Okay, so I, I try to respond to each point. Uh, Crimea did change hands in 1954, uh, but nobody killed each other over it. Again, it's important to understand from a libertarian perspective why from who that to is. Who? From Russia to Ukraine. Okay, and how was that done? It was done through just an administrative edict by the uh, Russian uh, federal government. So this was just done as a process of existing legal norms and mechanisms. And no one asked the people in, of Crimea or asked them with the referendum, correct? The Soviet simply... Union wasn't a democracy. Okay, sure. But my point is simply this. I am telling you as a libertarian, right? Self-determination of the people living there. When we want to know what they think, they weren't asked in 1954. They were Russian, meaning they belonged to the Russian, uh, you know, uh, RSFSR, which is the Soviet Socialist Republic. Then they became the Ukrainian RSFSR. Guess what? Nobody killed each other. It was considered an administrative change, you know, road signs and so forth. And life went on. That's the type of thing I'm talking about. I would like to see. That's what because happens is that same region. An on, author that's, that no, that's because an authoritarian government did something authoritatively. I think that's bad. You say there was no bloodshed. Yeah, that's because they were all controlled by a totalitarian leader. Like what, what, what you're describing, is, what, what you're right. describing right now is essentially saying it's okay to annex territory from another country because if both of those areas were controlled by the same dictator, then he would be able to swap land around without much of an issue. I am literally saying the almost the opposite. I'm saying, and I think we need to discuss our core values here because what I'm saying is. I like when there's less violence. I like when people are living in the same federation, like the United States or EU. Then Russia and shouldn't have I'm annexed Crimea. Well, can, can, can I have like 20 seconds to, to say what I'm saying? I think that when, uh, I think it's terrible that violent uh, annexation happens by empires and so on. But once that occurs and once the price has been paid, 
once the violence has occurred and now everyone speaks the same language, has the same roads and, you know, and so on. There's 50 states now that speak the same language and so on. I don't like how they formed. I didn't like the Mexican-American War. I don't like the extermination of Native Americans. And I don't like how they took Hawaii and so on. But what I am saying is, once that happened, I like that New Jersey doesn't consider it a sovereign country and won't start to fight over New York with New York and start World War III over Staten Island. I like that. Do you like that? Or do you think that a strong federal government uh, keeping peace or not letting people think too, too independently, nationally, you're saying is bad because, well, they're repressing New Jersey and New York, correct? They I don't think there's a comparison. I Why agree not? that it is good that countries do not randomly start violence over land claims, which is why I think it's bad that Russia did when they annexed Crimea. Ukraine did nothing well, we both wrong agree. Here. So we agree that in 1954, it was good that nobody killed each other over the Crimea transfer then. But it was bad that they existed under an authoritarian dictatorship where the people had no say whatsoever in how uh, their land was used or what country they were a part of. Both could be true. Right. You could have more liberalism like under Gorbachev. It began the perestroika and glasnost. If that was allowed to continue since 1990s, those 30 years, you could have a very liberal country by, by now. And they would still not have this war because the Ukrainians that would be born after 1991 would not consider Ukraine as such an important concept. So the territorial integrity of Ukraine must be fought over with blood. Um, Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but I don't understand the relevance to it. Because we're not talking about anyone randomly starting violence over an old land claim, except for Russia. Russia is the only group here that has done this. I'm literally telling you, so the people that live in Crimea, okay, forget about the countries of Ukraine and Russia. The people in 1991 had a referendum. In that referendum, the, re the choice was to have an independent Crimea or be part of Ukraine, okay? So many parts of Ukraine in 1991 voted to be part of Ukraine over 70%, but two regions did not. That was Crimea and Sevastopol. And that was because mostly Russians live there or whatever. I don't know. I'm not going to guess exactly why, but that's the truth. You know, there are a lot of Russians there. Only 54% of Crimeans actually voted to join. And that's a, that's a margin of error. That is so wait, so wait, you, wait, wait, you just that. said Crimea did not vote to stay in independent Ukraine, but then you just described the majority of the population voting to stay in independent Ukraine. I just said a 54% majority did, in fact, vote in 1991 to be part of Ukraine. That's yes. more than the ratio between um, Lula and... Would you mind silencing those alerts? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's my... Uh, yeah, sorry about that. No worries. That's more than the ratio between Lula and Bolsonaro in Brazil during their recent presidential election. That's a large lead in a presidential election. Either way, this is irrelevant. We are only talking about the rightness or the wrongness of what Russia did. Um, if the people of Crimea could have demonstrated that they were being legitimately oppressed by the Ukrainian government and that secession was a politically desirable goal, I might have supported it. They never demonstrated this, of course, and there wasn't really a push to do that. They got annexed. Okay. I'm I don't gonna... mind secessionary movements, though, if a good case can be made. Good. I think we have a lot of agreement if we just use the right language or we focus on similar things. I feel like you're very focused on countries being anthropomorphized and applying morality to what they do. And what I'm saying to you is all of these countries are doing bad things. You agree? Okay, we both agree that China, no, the United you States, you haven't described Russia Ukraine do doing anything. Things. You haven't described Ukraine doing anything wrong yet. Uh, well, I'm going to get to that, okay? Uh, I would like to talk about how Ukraine used cluster munitions on civilians and so on. But before I do... Why'd they do that? Let me just close the chapter on Crimea. Wait, did they use it on civilians or did they use it on Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass? Well, civilians died from it. Hospitals were bombed. I don't know what to tell you. Well, maybe Russia shouldn't have invaded the Donbass? Sure, but when I said blame game last time, I just want to be clear. If you Google the word blame game... I don't mean it in the sense that we can't tell who's right or wrong. The blame game is when you focus on he started it and then you act like children. And what you're supposed to do as adults is have problem solving strategies that involve more than just who is at fault, you but can't. rather how are you going to get out of this problem? You right? can't solve the problem unless you're willing to acknowledge who's at fault. Sometimes who's at fault 
the answer is there are bad people on every side. No, that's not what happened here. Russia initiated literally every level of aggression. There is no both sides. What you're doing there is fascist apologia, meaning that you also get the distinguished honor of being the bad guys. By equating a democratic country defending itself and a fascist country invading another, you are providing defense for that fascist country. It says this is okay. the blame game is Let's critical here before deciding who is at fault. Imagine imagine arriving at the end of World War II and mm -hmm. and not trying to find who is at fault uh, at the end of that conflict. Imagine, you know, the Nuremberg trials are getting set up or whatever. OK, well, you know, uh, Nazi Germany did this or that or whatever. But, you know, at the same time, also. Uh, we had, um, uh, you know, Dresden. I mean, we had um, civilians killed by the, the French and the British as well. You know, if you do not decide on who the initial moral criminal is, you can never then arrive at justice. Sometimes well, look, situations I, I, are very complicated, but World War II wasn't, and neither is this. Look, I understand the appeal of Godwin's law uh, because you want to have a clear moral case here. You want to have a bright line. The fact is, most wars are not like that. If I talked about Yemen or Vietnam or indeed Laos or anything, what you're going to get is you're going to get a complex patchwork of who was right and who was wrong. Israeli I'm talking Palestinian about the Russian invasion like of Ukraine. That. Yes, good. And that's also complex. And I want to get into that. It is not. Okay. Well, I think that's good. We have a disagreement here and let's dig in and figure out why you think it's so simple. Okay. So um, I just wanted... Once again, to just reiterate, Crimea is a special case because 54% voted to join Ukraine. It's possible that people's opinions change enough so that if they have a referendum and if the OSCE actually agreed to oversee it, they would have legitimately agreed that, hey, you know what? These people did actually vote to join Russia. And what then? What then? Because we don't have um, in the international system a very good way to respect that. I just want to say very quickly, I just want to say very quickly, hold on. May I just say this, that in, in 2017, Catalonia voted to secede from Spain and the Kurds voted to secede from Iraq. Neither referendum was respected. Indeed, the people were simply arrested by the Spanish. So I'm just telling you that even if the people want the Elon Musk way to, to vote, nobody, the UN is formed from countries, delegates of countries. They do not want secession. So we could talk about that. You seem to support secession sometimes. I'd love to hear none what you of think this, of Hong Kong. None of this is relevant. I want it to is, talk about well, why Russia... I don't Russia, know how you determine re relevance unilaterally. Like I this. want to okay, talk about why Russia is in the wrong. It is the only thing I'm interested in. I only examine why? the other details of these issues so I can better uh, examine the ways in which Russia is wrong. I'm fully interested in a moral assessment of the conflict, and every other thing that I learn only supports me in my moral denunciation. Mm-hmm. So I morally denunciate, denounce, sorry, uh, Russia for invading Ukraine. I also denounce Russia for arming rebels against the government, uh, the federal government, uh, the secessionists, okay? I will also say that the United States and other countries do that routinely. We've armed the Syrian rebels against Assad and so on. But I'm not but going to simply... We are only talking about this. We don't need to dilute things by making comparisons to other conflicts where other complexities might crop up and there might be slight differences that change our opinions. I'm only talking about this one instance here. But that's, okay, so, so you said last time something that I think almost conceded the whole point to the libertarian viewpoint. I want to take a step back since you do want to talk about morality and I do too, but I need to talk about, you know, adults and, and uh, people, uh, intelligent people tend to look for patterns. They don't look at one thing in isolation in all of history and say, this thing is a unique snowflake. They typically go and look at different conflicts and they see what types of things lead to the conflict. So even in your Hitler case, which you keep going back to, if all Hitler did was uh, annex uh, Austria and then not commit any genocides, not, no one would be killed and so forth, there would be a lot of people, like you said, in Austria who may have welcomed because they had a depression at the time uh, and, and the, you know, these, uh, the Nazi party creating jobs. Now, again, this would be a Nazi party that history would say would simply have been some sort of job creating party. Well, of course, annexing fantasy, right? Annexing another, yeah. another nation is still a pretty huge deal. 
we generally rely on the stability of our borders because border instability is like the number one cause of war. Randomly annexing a territory as a power grab for basically no humanitarian reason is morally um, condemnable under any circumstances. A good case has to be made. I have a default um, positive value towards border stability, even for countries I don't like, because border instability causes so, when you, so many when problems. You support, okay, so let's just explore your, again, I want to stay away from the, the Hitler and Nazis thing, because it's just like Ron Paul saying that, you know, the attack on 9-11 was motivated by our interventions in the Middle East. He got booed, and I can understand, because people get triggered very easily by, and, and who knows with these but fantasy with Nazis even nice. Yeah, so let's say, can we please stay away from the the Hitler thing and the Nazis thing, okay, just for the duration of this uh, no. discussion? There's plenty of other conflicts we could talk about. No, comparisons right? will still probably come up. Okay, well, here's a comparison. So then I, I would like to make a comparison. The war in Yemen has been raging since 2015. I wish more people would talk about it because millions of people, according to the UN, are facing hunger. They're one step away from hunger. Now, how did that war happen? It's very similar. It's a proxy war, but this time between our Saudi allies and Iran. Okay. So how much do you know about the Houthi rebels and the start of that war? I haven't had to do much research on the Yemen conflict because I haven't had a debate on it. I don't know enough to competently make many assertions. Okay. I'm just going to say, make one assertion in general. Uh, I do believe that this, the reason that the Yemen conflict, despite having way more misery and death and being the worst humanitarian crisis currently, even given that Ukraine is happening, the reason that people aren't talking about it is threefold. One, it's not in Europe. They're not white Christians. Okay. Uh, B, is that they are essentially uh, not a way to starve Russia of resources, or in the words of Brzezinski, make Russia bleed for as long and as hard as we can, mm -hmm. okay? So there's no, maybe Iran, maybe we can make Iran bleed, but Iran is not really invested so much in this war as, as one may think. And the third is simply that, um, well, I would say it's a, yeah, it's a, never mind. let's just keep it to- Of to what relevance game. is this though? Well, if, you're, if your goal is to care about human suffering and ending it... Right? My goal and, and make... right now is to talk about the Ukraine war. There's a problem with over-broadness in analysis, where sometimes people will try to implicitly defend a subject by insisting that an overemphasis on it is actually contributing to a broader problem, which I really disagree with. I don't like it when people do that. So, like, we see this often with American diabolism, right? Like, you have the conflict in Ukraine and bad things are happening. But people will then say, ah, well, did you know that overwhelmingly the um, side in a conflict America supports is actually the wrong side? Take a look at all these conflicts. This can be interesting. I don't mind it when people do this inherently. It's good to criticize America. But um, when doing this in the context of a conversation on the Ukraine war, it kind of serves to minimize what's happening in Ukraine. You know, like, oh, maybe this and this, sure, but also this, that, this, and the other. And once you're doing that, you kind of engage in a sort of soft apologia, which I'm very, very cautious about because I see it happen a lot in, in discourse. So I appreciate what you're saying about whataboutism. I happen to be firmly on the other side of the issue. I do think what ab the word whataboutism is a license to engage in horrific double standards where you navel gaze at one specific conflict while we ask, like, where were you? Are you ever going to talk about the Yemen conflict? Well, I didn't have time to look look at it. It's been like eight years. It's millions of people suffering. Like maybe you should take a look at it. I've never you know, seen a person take a pro whataboutism stance, but in a way, I think I kind of respect it. Um, Thank you. The fact remains: if you disagree with any of my other foreign policy positions, I'm happy to substantiate them. But all of them are consistent with my belief that the defense of Ukraine. Um, is, is essential and we should... Sure, I, I, I want to ask about the consistency of your positions, but I just wanted to say, you said something in our last talk, and by the way, we're giving each other time is great because I think we're having a much pr more productive discussion. It's better for uh, sure. Hopefully, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, okay, so like, first of all, you've said something in that last discussion that, it, you know, when I reviewed it, it all it stood out to me as like, you're almost conceding the point to libertarianism, but I need to first tell, uh, hear from you, what is your approach? What is the core of your approach? I'll tell you the core of my approach, okay? And then I'll tell you what you said. 
that I think uh, kind of concedes the point, which is fine. I'm not here to win or defeat someone. I'm here to get to a mutual understanding, right? And, and agreement. So my position as a libertarian is to say, look, people are born into this world and you know, they live in the 21st century or whatever, okay? 7% of all people that have ever been alive are alive right now. Who knows? We may solve mortality at some point or whatever. So, so we're here on this planet, okay? And we have ideas about, you know, we used to kill each other for religious wars. Uh, the Crusades were horrific, uh, you know, and then um, we learned something called multiculturalism where we could live side by side with a Muslim and a Christian and a Buddhist. And, you know, we figured out how to avoid killing each other and all these conflicts. We also, and this is where I'm different than many libertarians, I'm a left libertarian, but I also look at technology and improvements in our systems. So, for example, if I get into a car accident with someone, my insurance company calls their insurance company and they've seen hundreds and thousands of these cases. They know what to require, what evidence, and they solve it with no violence required. Similarly, if I have a dispute over uh, someone, you know, sending me a, a bad product that I paid for, my bank and their bank, the merchant bank, will work it out. I can dispute with a credit card and it doesn't even involve a court case, let alone violence. My point is there are many ways to solve probably 99% of human conflicts that have been invented in the last you know, 200 years and so on. And, and, and we've been inventing more. We should be focused on trying to resolve things using what I called previously frameworks, uh, laws and other frameworks like the banking regulations or whatever. And we're, we have to increase how we do that because if we keep thinking in terms of nationalism, et cetera, and countries, it's a little bit like the tribalism that we used to have with religion. And I would like to see if we can, over time, minimize the tribalism and the morality that you seem to ascribe to Russia or Ukraine or whatever, and talk about people and the politicians they elect. Tribalism. Does that make sense? I get it. But tribalism is just a part of human behavior. It's just a factor in, in sociological analysis. But I don't think it's relevant to what Ukraine is doing. Plenty of Ukrainians are nationalists, don't get me wrong. I'm not defending nationalism as a concept, except in instances where it can be useful, which I suppose it is here. What I'm caring about here, fundamentally, is stability uh, and human well-being. Uh, the behavior that Russia is engaging in is detrimental to human life. Ukraine, not so much so. Um, Ukraine doesn't act perfectly, no one does, but for the most part, Ukraine is a liberal democracy, has done a far better job taking care of its people and respecting other people than Russia has in either circumstance. Russia's invasion was unprovoked, and if you want to prevent that kind of behavior from becoming more popular in the future, unprovoked invasions by fascist empires to assimilate liberal democracies, you have to crush them. You have to make it impossible for them to do that sort of thing ever again. You can do this economically or militarily. I mean, there's a million ways you can do it, but it has to happen. It's necessary because if you don't do it, there's no incentive structure or framework which prevents them from engaging in that behavior in the future. That's what I'm concerned about. I appreciate it. And I almost like I agree that at this point we might have to, as you say, crush uh, Russia's uh, attempts to, you know, uh, retain the gains that they have had. But I don't think that will solve the problem worldwide. Um, and something you said last time underscores that. You said, yes, sometimes we're the bastards. The United States, you know, has done so much regime change and so on. But in this one case, you said, in this one case, I would love to see the underdog beat the, you know, the bully. And in this one case, we're going we're gonna to have the correct outcome, right? You said something along those lines. We're doing the right time. thing right now. Militarily supporting right. Ukraine is the morally just thing to do. If we did this every time, we would literally be the arsenal of democracy. We would be heroes. So to me, that, by the way, that sounds a lot like American exceptionalism, but- We are exceptional. That... We're the strongest nation on earth. If we use that strength for good, we would do more good than any other nation ever could. Sure, that's a big if. But here's what I would like to say. The fact that you said, in this one case, I want it to win, almost concedes the fact that the system is broken. I'm talking about the international system, uh, all the laws that we currently have up to this point. Now, yes, we've had improvements, like the Geneva Conventions were huge improvements. I mean, the, the meat grinder that was World War I and World War II and all the horrific stuff that people used to do up to that point. I mean, 
goodness, the Romans, the, what, the crucifixions. All I'm saying is, yes, we have made progress as humanity, but you are almost like trying to get in this one case, finally a win. And what I'm trying to say, doesn't that show you that this is the exception that shows that the rule is we are still, our system is very, it has a lot of failure modes and a lot of violence still, right? Of course, but this is the best we've ever done. And that means so, we should support it. If you want to change oh. a system, like say America's biases in a post-Cold War geopolitical sense, you have to incentivize the good behaviors. And this is definitely an example of that. In one fell swoop, we get to militarily crush Russia, which is one of our greatest enemies in terms of potential down the line threat, for a fraction of our defense budget. We support a liberal democracy. We preserve border stability in Europe, which is, trust me, in everyone's best interest. And we crush the spread of fascism abroad. It's an unambiguous win from both a liberal and leftist perspective, which is not common, just not a thing that happens that often. Um, Obviously, the broader framework is still fucked, but I have seen signs of positive change. For instance, literally just today, um, you know, we've seen the fruit of some other foreign policy, uh, uh, you know, decision making that I agree with. Biden had his national security advisor go over to Brazil to talk with Lula, uh, Lula da Silva uh, on preventing uh, a Bolsonaro coup. You know, like how to prevent a Gen 6 from happening which happened mm -hmm. today. And, you know, it was kind of an embarrassment for Bolsonaro's crew. Um, this is literally America's liberal president sending over a national security advisor to protect a democratically elected socialist from fascist violence. If we could do shit like this more often, we would be the moral epicenter of the world. We would be what the Soviet Union tried to be for developing countries during the Cold War. We would be able to lift them. We would make them stronger. So we have to support I this behavior. I have to enthusiastically agree with you. I think more cooperation between countries and listening to each other, regardless of the other country's ideology, even if it's North Korea or Iran, I think that's good, of course. I happen to like the Iran deal, for example. I also liked Clinton's agreed framework with Kim Jong-il, uh, you know, but the problem is, you know, the United States has different parties. And as soon as the opposing party will come in, they will nix any of the deals like they have with Korea and like they have with Iran. Um, and so I don't have and like they've done with Cuba, uh, you know, over and over. These countries are, as you say, our enemies and so on. To me, that's silly. I mean, we're in the 21st century. What is Cuba exactly? What, how are they threatening us? You know, why should we have sanctions on them? I don't even know. Does anyone? I, this is what I'm saying. So what is your, do you defer to authority? Like what, what is your source? Let me go back. What is your worldview? You haven't told me, you've told me about Russia, whereas I have told you about generally my worldview. What is your worldview? Like, what are you trying to say is wrong now? And how do you attempt to fix it exactly? I just want people to be healthy and happy. Not living under fascism is a big part of that. Um, I will have a general bias towards stability because global instability causes a lot of people to suffer, even if you're doing it for good. I'm in favor of some kinds of instability if I think they lead to enough good down the road that it justifies it. So for example, World War II, the decision to participate in World War II from America or this, you know, aiding the land lease, blah, blah. These things, they decrease world stability in the short term. But in the long term, I think they're the right move to make, um, as is the case here. Uh, though in this case, I don't even think we're contributing to world instability for a short time. So it seems like a pretty upfront victory. Um, but no, it, this isn't about nationalism, decision making or frameworks. Uh, it's about making sure that we are set on the right path making the right decisions when it counts. The people who we are fighting over there in Russia via Ukraine, you know, we being, I guess, the broader left, they're here in America too. The American Republican Party is a fascist party, as the Russian government itself is fascist. It is the Republicans here in America who do not want us to support Ukraine. It is the Republicans who want Ukrainian children to be raped and burned by Russian soldiers. They want this because Russia's strength is their strength. The strength of a foreign liberal democracy is to our benefit, and the strength of a foreign fascist oligarchy is to theirs. So they support the oligarchy. The only well, thing we can do know, here is support the right people. There is no third choice. We either support mm. Ukraine or do not. 
and the outcomes of supporting Ukraine are superior to those where we do not. I suppose we so, can support Russia. That is a possibility, but I don't suggest it. Well, sure. I don't think we would ever do that as the United States, even when they were liberal or even when they, the United uh, USSR fell. But uh, what I, you know, even though at times what you're saying is super hyperbolic with the fascists, um, it's I not. will simply. I fully believe it. Okay. So you fully believe that we should fight fascism everywhere and neo Nazis. And... Of course. What else should we do? Okay. So in that case, I think it would be good to focus this discussion on Ukraine before Russia's invasion or arming uh, rebels. Okay. From what you've been saying, it sounds like you have an incomplete picture of what happened before uh, 2015, okay? So let me just tell you, if you were observing the events in Ukraine in 2013 and 14 and previous years, you would find that far more nationalist parties than the, than the Republican Party, like the Svoboda Party uh, in Ukraine, had been elected. In some regions, they had as much as 35% support. This was in the west of Ukraine. So from what I understand, I take you at your word that you're against neo-Nazis, fascists, and so on. Thank you. Uh, okay. These, uh, some of them, some, I'm not going to say, but some people in Ukraine are obviously descended from people that really didn't like Russia. And I can understand that because of the Holodomor and many other things. So in World War II, when the Nazis, the literal Nazis came, uh, they actually uh, joined them and uh, happen to, you know, kill Jews, uh, sometimes enthusiastically. Unfortunately, my own family, for example, uh, my uh, two of my grandmother's sisters got murdered as five-year-old children uh, by Ukrainians. Uh, but again, that's way in the past. What I'm saying is, uh, you know, after the war, these things continued. Some of the Bandera, the uh, OUN, and so on. Uh, operated. Some of them operated out of uh, a sort of a partisan, I don't know what you call it in, uh, in English, uh, in Ukrainian, basically like partisans, like people who are operating after a war, like the KKK, right? Um, and so that happened. But my point is this, you would certainly be against that ideology, right? You would be against uh, people who want Ukraine for Ukrainians and Jews and, you know, Russian sympathizers can leave or or would get kicked out, right? You would be against that, at least. Of course. I would, know, I would be nowhere near as enthusiastic about the defense of Ukraine if Zelensky's government was as fascist as the Russian government. In fact, if it was two fascist countries duking it out, my only interest would be in border stability, just because, you know, fighting, you know, there's no good outcome here, really. It's just suffering. Uh, I would be much less enthusiastic. I probably wouldn't even care if America supplied arms to Ukraine if they were as bad as Russia in that respect. Because at that point, we're not even defending anything worthwhile. It's purely a matter of border stability, and we might not need to get involved there. So I want to say that the vast majority of Ukrainians and Russians are good people. I'm talking about, when I say good, I mean regular people don't want to kill each other. They want to marry each other. They want to raise children. They want to earn enough money to bring home and have dinner with their family. Okay? They don't really care much. Uh, which flag uh, flies over something 2,000 miles away. Their media will make them care. Their schools will definitely make them care. And the schools can be by whichever government program decides, you know, pledge allegiance to whichever flag. And so they will be made to care. And I think that the people who grew up after 1991 are very different than the babushkas, you know, who were in the east of Ukraine. The babushkas were coming out in anti-Maidan protest, and I guarantee you they're not astroturfed. When you look at PBS Frontline, The Battle for Ukraine, if you Google that, you'll see a lot of videos from 2013. What happened was the perception was that the Maidan protests, the Maidan protests were in fact led by ordinary Ukrainians and started with students, as it often does, but then the most organized, and according to BBC, uh, these are mainstream things from 2014, highlighting that neo-Nazi and far-right nationalist extremists were the most organized and the most effective in the uprising that toppled uh, Yanukovych's government. What I'm trying to say is that if you were on a side that opposed 
and Nazis, you would find a lot of people in the east of Ukraine agreeing with you and their motivation legitimately not astroturfed for coming out by the thousands in Kharkiv and Odessa, not just in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. It's interesting to me that you nix one of the biggest motivators for East Ukrainians supporting or opposing the Euromaidan protests. And that's because being ethnically Russian, a lot of them had an ethnic and national bias towards Russia. So you talk about rejecting nationalist biases, but a lot of the anti-Euromaidan people were themselves um, highly sympathetic to Russia on a cultural and national sure. level. Sure. They were. In fact, I don't reject reality. I am simply, there's two things, recognizing reality as it is, right? We all are, we have our backgrounds. Uh, people grow up in uh, Gaza. They grow up in Jerusalem. They have different viewpoints, depending on which side of Jerusalem they grew up on and so on. So that's reality. But then you also, I, I'm talking to you about their motivations. They came out, these old ladies who are hysterical and calling for Putin to save them, okay, some of them, are not put there by the Russian government. They are literally people who live there. There are millions of people. And the other thing is, these people are currently disenfranchised since 2014. They do not vote in Ukrainian elections. How can you call Ukraine a democracy when millions of its citizens are disenfranchised? I the same people we're jumping that elected... around the timeline a little sure. bit. First of all, the legitimacy of the support from these babushkas is irrelevant. I don't give a fuck what they support. The majority of the Ukrainian people supported siding with the EU. Yanukovych was a Russian puppet who pushed them otherwise, as Putin told him to. He killed civilian protesters, as he was told to, and he fled, as he was told not to. I condemn to. all that, but he was right. elected democratically. He was. Up, correct? Well, I mean, he did cheat the first election, of course. The second time... I'm not talking about 2004. I right. agree. That the election was contested. Right. The other time. And he fled, thus ceding the office. Um, Hold on. You're conflating his fleeing. Forget the... Can we please uh, look well, uh, chronologically but, before his fleeing? Wait, hold, okay? but, wait, wait, wait. But I, I didn't... I wanted to address what you had to say. Right. And then you talk about democracy. You talk about this, that, the other. Uh, so are, what, are we, what are we trying to do right now? Are we making a, an impassioned plea for the persecution of Russian-speaking Russian ethnic minorities in the Donbass? What evidence is there of this persecution? Here's what uh, my, my Keep plea in mind, is. by the way, mm -hmm. that America today ethnically persecutes plenty of groups, and we remain a liberal democracy. Ethnic persecution is the rule, not the exception, all around the world. It does not make it good, but I don't like the implication that this in some way equates them to Russia, the fascist oligarchy that's bearing them down. There's a huge difference there. Because trust me, a lot me, of agreement, but also you are you're triggered by Russia bad. Okay, it's I not, get wait, 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 Russia stop. Wait, sure. no, 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 no. You don't get to just throw information out there. This stories with the babushkas, how whether I want to focus on wait, that information. Please, please. I want to you, answer your question. You, wait, you talked for a while. Okay, you throw out a lot of information which has a clear, implicit message. No one here is dumb enough to miss it. You talk about, oh, how can Ukraine call itself a democracy with this or that? You are positively comparing Russia to them. You may still say Russia what? is worse, but none of this information is relevant to. I just want to be no. I want to be clear. About. You're making a positive claim that Ukraine is a democracy. I want them to be a democracy. It is and a they democracy. Were. Hold, well, I don't know how you can consider something to be a democracy which disenfranchised literally a huge percentage of its population. Every country on Earth disenfranchises a portion of its population. They have I a system which responds... I am talking about the percentage of the population which elected Yanukovych, the party of regions. Of its what, voter of what evidence? Has been completely disenfranchised since how, 2014. How so? They cannot vote in national elections. How so? They sent, Their vote simply isn't counted. Their vote? So just how? What? Because they are in Donbass, uh, they are in Luhansk and Oh, Donetsk. okay. And what happened in the Donbass? That's what I'm telling you chronologically. It's in an occupied area. So it's a democracy in which democracy is wait, only are you Wait, those... are you blaming Ukraine for being in... Like, yeah, they can't count no, votes in the, the area controlled by Russia. I want to be clear. I don't assign blame because I think it's useless for solving conflict. Okay, why do you think they're not counting votes in the area currently controlled by armed Russian separatist militants? 
because they don't like they well in the past they didn't like the minsk agreements which called for and again were promoted by russia France, never followed the minsk Belarus. okay no stop this is i i refuse to i refuse to go down this road this is too laughable okay it is Why? occupied territory the reason yes. the votes there aren't counted is because there is a foreign military in that area ukraine but is prior not, to that ukraine is not less of a democracy because there is a foreign military occupying an area which makes it impossible to fully contribute to democracy. That's I ridiculous. understand, Bush, but we've got to we've got to be able to do this. We've got to be able to go chronologically before a certain event and then act as if this we're not going to talk about this event yet and just describe what led up to the event. OK, without invoking future events uh, as a, pre, a re rationale for past events. OK, so can we pick 2014? The, the Maidan before Russia invaded. So before when Russia... were they disenfranchised? Because, hold on, Yanukovych fled on February 22. They were disenfranchised ever since they uh, went out to secede and protest against the Maidan. Okay. Ever so, since then. So to be clear, okay, so I want to tell you the window of time during which you're saying millions were given, were take, had the, uh, the right to vote taken from them. Yanukovych fled on the 22nd of... February. The Donbass was invaded just one month later in March 2014. There was a one month gap between Yanukovych fleeing and the Donbass being invaded. So, how could there possibly have been voter disenfranchisement of the people in that area that was not a product of Russia prompting? the invasion. I think the most important thing here is to understand how we go about solving problems and describing things. Okay. So for me, I look at things systemically. I really I want a direct answer to this question. You're telling me that in one month they passed legislation to disclude them from democracy? How? No, effectively they never voted again. Because they were I mean, invaded by election. Russia. Because they were invaded by Russia. But you said Look, that this I was can, before can, the Russian invasion. It's a bit like saying, if you will permit me, it's a bit like saying in 2006, Gazans elected Hamas. I was following that election and I saw they elected Hamas largely because of the social programs that were superior to Fatah, not, me, not necessarily because of Hamas's stance of rejecting Israel's uh, ex right to exist. How can they but vote afterwards, when they're invaded? But afterwards, here's the point. Afterwards, they never had an election again. Why, so do, the majority why have they not had an election? Why? Because the majority of the why? majority no no no, of no, 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 Why have the people in the Donbass not been able to participate in a democratic election in Ukraine? It's not disenfranchisement. It's another thing that happened. You're lying if you say it's anything other than. No, you're lying if you're saying it's that simple. The okay. reason that it no, hasn't you happened. Can't. No, 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 no. I will tolerate mm -hmm. some banter, but on some issues, you are so unmistakably wrong that I will not allow us to progress past it. Civil civility ends, civility ends wrong. here, okay? So, okay. this is retarded. They were invaded one month after Yanukovych fled. You did this whole lead up talking about how the people of the Donbass were discriminated against, how they were persecuted, removed from democracy, how could Ukraine possibly be a liberal democracy if they would remove millions from the vote? And what actually happened? Russia removed them from the vote by invading. You. Any other framing of this event is lying. It's not just dishonesty, it's willful just lying. Just because you said, I said the same thing back to you. You said, I'm lying and I'm trying to rhetorically tell you. You did lie because if I wasn't the kind of person who I knew about this or B, Googled things while talking, I would have just gone on and accept, oh, millions of people. I am people, not lying. Millions of people were disenfranchised you... by, by, by the new Ukrainian government. Again, oh, of I don't know what you're, I, I don't see your screen. I don't know what you're Googling. But I will tell you, you can Google right now, Frontline PBS, the battle for Ukraine. All you have to do is look at what BBC, Newsweek... What election were they not allowed to vote in? I'm sorry? I'm not going to look up a specific documentary section. What election were they not allowed to vote in? You can look up BBC Newsnight. You can look up any, any time, from that time, any... Just any BBC Newsnight, like any of them? 
No, BBC News Night about the neo Nazis in the Maidan. Like literally, they went. To, they they interviewed all of them. They actually went, and back then it was a completely okay, different. Okay, so you narrative. so you watched it. Share the knowledge with me. What election were I'm, millions I'm of to... Russian speaking people not allowed to participate in? Okay, so you're conflating two things. You did this before with the invasion of twenty two and fourteen. You call that an invasion? Fine. But now you're conflating two other things. You're conflating my statement that these people were never allowed to vote again, and therefore- Why weren't they allowed to vote again? Can I finish my thought nope. and then I'll answer that question? No, no, because you won't I'll ever answer. No, 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 I've talked with you twice. I know you won't answer it. I'm holding it to you here. I will. Why? No, 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 you won't. you won't, you won't, you won't. Why, just you, then you can continue. Why weren't they able to vote? I'll hold you to that. Um, they weren't able to vote in 2013 because at the time we're talking wait you was... were talking after wait no now you're conflating we're talking after Euromaidan that's what you said I'm trying to answer your question but you said and after early, Euromaidan early. that isn't attributable to the Russian invasion look I'll just give you the answer you want to hear and then I'll talk okay the answer, the answer to the question hear. yes yeah the answer to the question that you want to hear is that by Arming the rebels in the Donbass, Russia had escalated the conflict, and I blame them for that severely, because that is they what led to They didn't escalate the conflict. There was no conflict. They started the conflict. There was no conflict? Really? Did, I'm sorry, did Ukraine have troops in Russia at the time? Ukraine had troops in the Donbass. You mean in Ukraine? Do you think killing your own people is good? Wait, no, 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 stop. You're doing it again. They didn't escalate the conflict. Russia, a foreign nation, was not under attack by Ukraine. They initiated the conflict. When are you going to give me 60 seconds of uninterrupted? <laughs> you can't say. They, they're like, oh, well, Ukraine had troops in the Donbass. Yeah, Fine. in Ukraine. Th that's Ukraine. May Donbass I, I'm is Ukraine. I'm trying to answer as best I can, but I need 60 seconds, man. Can I, can I just do that? Okay, but seconds. if you lie in the first five, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm literally trying to be as accurate as I can, let alone not lie, okay? So if there's anything I've said that's wrong, I'd like you to point out specifically what it is. I have been. You get mad respond. at me when I do that. Give me a chance to respond. I didn't get mad. I simply said you're lying by omission, right? By, by focusing only on a small part of why they didn't vote. Sure. One aspect, one factor is that Russia got involved. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. That's terrible. And, and we shouldn't be, uh, you know, we shouldn't be and no country should be uh, arming rebels against the government. Completely agree. Stability was sacrificed. So did you get what you wanted to hear? Now I'd like to spend Well, they initiated seconds. the conflict. They didn't contribute to it. And I also just want to know how these poor ethnically Russian people were kept from participating in democracy. I'm very happy to tell you, but it takes more than 10 seconds. I, I can't. If you're going to cut me off after 10 seconds, I won't be able to tell you. Okay. I mean, um, I'm, I'm here to learn. Well, thank you. And again, everything I'm saying can be backed up by PBS, BBC, Newsweek, and any mainstream source from 2014. Okay? So here's the timeline of events. I'll try to fit it in. I'm sorry. It will take me 120 seconds. Two minutes. Okay? But it's important. This takes place before Russia's aggression. Okay? This, however, takes place uh, with Russia's influence. Um, countries are influenced by other countries, especially, quote, the great powers and so on. So here's what happens. Yanukovych was democratically elected. You see, Ukraine had a democracy and people were voting for their representatives and in, indeed their presidents. So when Yanukovych was elected, the time to the next election was about two years. Now, normally, if you don't like what the government is doing, you simply call, you know, you wait till the next election and you vote. We don't want the January 6th. We don't want something in Brazil resembling January 6th. And we don't want that in Ukraine. There was You're absolutely one. right that what happened in the Maidan and the overthrow of the government led to a destabilization. They didn't overthrow the government. Okay, they overthrew the executive branch of no, the government. No, he fled. They were protesting, which is legally their right. What they happened were... before he fled? What happened in the days before he fled? Protests you know? outside government buildings, which is what protests tend to be. Oh, it was way more than that. Do you believe January 6th to be a coup? A coup attempt. A coup attempt. This is January 6th times 10. No, it wasn't. So by every metric, by every description, carrying guns into the Capitol building, 
carrying guns into the Congress, uh, overrunning barricades. By every metric, they overran the Congress. They went into the building. They had guns in every sense of, of, of the word. And it was all started when right-wing nationalists, where a small minority, started firing and then escalated so conflict because this, many this people had like, guns. This was several lies in a row. Uh, the, um, this is the, on Wikipedia, so by no, the way. It's, no, it's not. I, and I ousted you on well, Wikipedia. Go to before. Revolution of Dignity on Wikipedia right now. There were want. massive protests and the violence was initiated when Yanukovych was told by Putin to start firing on the crowd. Yanukovych also tried to pass through his Congress uh, a number of highly authoritarian uh, anti-protester laws. It's also true. Yes. What you're saying is so true as well. The, as soon it as doesn't he, negate what I'm saying, which is also it, true. It does, because you're lying. It was not a small group of Nazi um, Wikipedia is lying. So there was an wait, incident. I'm sorry, wait, hold on. Nope. Because you lie every time okay, you get something specific. No, no, no. What's the Wikipedia, Wikipedia article? Uh, the Revolution of Dignity. Hold on. I'm going to read verbatim from it. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. All right. I'm going to look for the section. One moment. I mean, it's an entire large article. The first protesters were killed in fiery clashes with police on Khrushchevskovo Street on the 19th and 27th of January. Protesters occupied government buildings through the country. The deadliest crashes were on 18th to 20th of February, which saw the most severe violence in Ukraine since it regained independence. Thousands of protesters advanced towards Parliament, led by activists with shields and helmets, and were fired on by police snipers. Continue, please. On the 21st of February, an agreement between President Yanukovych and the leaders of the parliamentary opposition was signed that called for a formation of an interim unity government, constitutional reforms, and early elections. On the following what was wrong day with that? What was wrong with those uh, concessions and proposals? no concessions? He needed to be gone. Okay, continue. Um, uh, agreement. For, uh, the following day, police withdrew from central Kiev, which came under effective control of the protesters. Yanukovych fled the city. That day, the Ukrainian parliament voted to remove Yanukovych uh, from office uh, by three hundred and twenty-eight to zero. Um, mm -hmm. With all of the I'm talking about. Uh, hold on, I overran. Okay, so I wasn't prepared. Police stormed. Okay, one one moment. I'm going to actually. I won't be able to do this in real time. However, what I'm trying to say is there was a time when the government offered uh, concessions to Klitschko and uh, right sector Dmitry Yarish and others. What concessions? They Get said it's too. Hold on, one moment. They, they said it's too little, too late, and he has to go. That's true. But if you look at the how the violence uh, spread, when people say. Um, uh, who started the firing and who started the uh, the guns? Uh, it was it turned out, and I I will find this to you later, and I encourage people. Even if listening. it turned out to be the protesters, I wouldn't really care. But no, it I wasn't read, just it was the, the protesters. The the the, the peaceful the, the civilians did have guns. However, the nationalists were sparked the uh, initial uh, people. Um, we're wondering who fired the initial uh, shots. You know, to to start the wave of violence. And what I'm trying to say is. Uh, that was the nationalist, right? Even if that number... was the case, it wouldn't really bother me. I don't uh, really care. They were uh, right to protest. Just... Yanukovych was in the wrong. And they, they are allowed to protest, but when they overrun barricades and enter the Congress building, wouldn't that look like not January 6th, essentially? Yeah, the problem with January 6th was more what they were trying to do than how they did it. You know, the, you to know the sitting was a... president. You, to oust a sitting president. Yeah, well... Or an elected president. Yeah, the difference is January 6th was them getting angry and denying the results of a democratic election, whereas in the case of Yanukovych, he was trying to turn their country into a dictatorship. You want to hear some of these provisions, by the way? Some of the stuff he tried to pass? This is crazy. Oh, Yanukovych is not great. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> hold on. You. Listen, my man tried to do a one-man coup. He was a Putin stooge, and when he realized that people wasn't going along with his anti-popular decision to side with Russia over the EU, on economic reform, he tried to essentially turn the country into an authoritarian dictatorship. Listen to this, okay? Criminalizing extremist activity, which according to TI Ukraine is defined in broad and vague terms with a hefty fine for a first offense and up to three years in jail for a repeat offense, simplifying the process of removal of parliamentary immunity in criminal proceedings to a majority revote in the parliament, a prior review is no longer required by the parliamentary committee, extending and applying amnesty from prosecution previously adopted um, by the Verkhovna Rada to those who committed crimes against protesters 
including Berkut security forces and other law enforcement officials. Essentially, legally, you could do whatever you wanted against them. Murder, rape, who cares? Oh, one moment here. I found it, by the way. I found what I was talking about. So it's under detailed timeline, okay, under Revolution of Dignity, 18 February 20, uh, 2014. Drivers of so motorcades of more than five cars causing traffic jams face the loss of their driver's what? license. What? No. For two what are years. you talking about? The night before the clashes, right sector called. Defamation, so either by means of press or social media, carries a penalty what? of up to one year in jail. What are you reading about? Gathering and disseminating information about the Berkut judges or their families carries a penalty of up to two years in jail. I'm just reading how Yanukovych was trying to do a one-man coup by single-handedly undoing democracy. Okay. This so is I agree bad. with you. I am against authoritarians, as you can imagine. Mandatory but what I'm trying to get you to do is read Wikipedia under detailed timeline, starting with February 18th, 2014. All right. Thank you. Wait, where? Wait, on this page? Where? It's under Revolution of Dignity, Wikipedia, under Detailed Timeline. It starts there. Okay, here we go. February 18th. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, February 18th, the Kiev Metro stopped all service because of a terrorist threat. The night before the clashes, right sector which for I'm sure people know is a uh, was the largest uh, nationalist uh, organization that was armed, called on its members to ready themselves for a quote peace offensive on 18 February. The Maidan People's Union also urged all concerned citizens to take part in this peace offensive, which student unions had agreed to join as well. The Maidan Union reported that on the morning of the columns of protesters would begin a march. Now, that morning, around 20,000 demonstrators marched on the parliament building. Okay, January 6th, they marched on the Congress as that body was set to consider opposition demands for a new constitution and government. Last time you asked me whether they demanded a new constitution. In fact, yes, they did, and they got it. A new constitution and government. Around 9.45, the demonstrators broke through the police barricade of several um, trucks near the building, the Central Club of Ukraine, and pushed the cordon of police aside, similar to January 6th. The clashes started after You keep comparing these just to you. I think this is completely based, by the way. I wish our January 6th was like this. Interesting. So that's, you just said that you don't like what happened in Brazil. You don't like January 6th. Yeah, now you're that's saying because the January 6th protesters were fascists. Brazil, the Bolsonaro stands, were fascist. These guys were protesting Yanukovych turning their country into an authoritarian dictatorship. So 20,000 demonstrators marching on the parliament building demanding a new constitution and government, to me, sounds like destabilizing the country. For good, yeah. Destabilization is justified if it has good long-term outcomes. In this case, it did. The Putin stooge and authoritarian left, and they got a liberal democracy afterwards. Zelensky's government has overseen a great um, revival of Ukraine in a number of ways, in spite of the fact that Russia keeps nipping at them from the east. Whoa, whoa. So, Vosh, just I want to understand your positions, right? Your principles. Are you saying your principles are good only for people you don't like or people you like go and do the same thing and you support that? Like, what are your principles for stability and overthrowing governments then? I don't understand. Can you give me a consistent? Yes, it's okay. good when good things happen and bad when huh. bad things happen. It's oh, good when course. fascists lose and bad when good guys lose. So you believe in good guys and bad guys? Yes, I believe, believe in the concept of ethics. Me and every other person who's ever thought about it for more you than You literally sound years. like the Republicans who believe that there was a good and bad and uh, moral. Everyone and believes in ethics, including you. You've been making ethical appeals the entire time we've been talking. Yes. Sure. Some didn't groups are, no, you stop, to stop, stop. Okay. Some groups are better than others. Fascists leading a government are worse than leftists leading a government. So I am willing to fight for leftist leading government, even if there's some hardship along the way, because the outcome you get from the long term is superior to the hardship you experience in the short term. This is also known as politics. This is how all politics works. Literally everything you do and fight for is going to come at the cost of something. So you better make sure that whatever you're trying to get to is ethically worthwhile, right? I'm uh, no, I'm completely. <laughs> you're talking about a zero sum game. Okay, we're so wait, okay, wait, okay. So wait, let me let me try to okay, let, let me try to okay. So no, we're not talking zero sum game. Okay, let me let me try this. Okay, so the Nazis lost. That's good, right? Because the Nazis yes. were bad. 
Okay. Yes. Well, how do you? How can you possibly say that? Are you saying it's good when people lose? Because you... they committed a genocide. They were going to kill more people. Wait. Okay. Wait. 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 So let me get this straight. You think it's good when people lose just because you don't like other things they've done? Uh, it's not just some people did something, bro. They killed an entire. They went after gypsies and Jews and 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 look at the Japanese how they were genociding uh, Chinese. Yes, that's bad. Man. They didn't think yes. that was bad. Yes, and they were wrong. Well, how can you, bro? You you sound like those Republicans. Because I talk about killing, genociding millions of people is wrong. You're talking about if our guys win, the leftists win. We could totally destroy governments and overturn uh, elections and constitutions. What is your standard here? So oh, was so, Stalin okay, one more time. not when he was robbing banks? Was no, he, he was not good or bad. Stalin was bad. Um, okay. Overturning. So, but, but, and he was a leftist, though. Wasn't overturning. He? No. Overturning an authoritarian government is good. A popular protest. Was Castro a leftist? Yes. And okay. yes, he's better was than Mao Batista. So was Mao a leftist? It really depends on what day you met him. I see. Well, on the day he was a leftist, was he totally cool in, you know, confiscating uh, the food from the villagers and causing, exacerbating a famine for three years? What the fuck are you talking about? The Great Famine in China. Are you asking if I'm pro-famine? No, I'm simply saying that you are arbitrarily choosing a label like leftist, and you're approving the okay. very actions that you rail against so in the other we, case this because is, this, we're, we're running all the way back. Like, we're, we're, we're like beyond epistemics right now. We're like at the beating heart of the universe when we talk on these issues, okay? I need you to right, understand what's your this. Position? I Consistent think position. good things are good and bad things are bad. That's a tautology that says nothing. Oh, okay. Everyone well, then, thinks that. Then we'll, build, then we'll build out one further, okay? I think that if you're going to overthrow the government, you'd better have a damn good reason. And it's a bad reason. If you're a bunch of fascists who want to overturn the democratic election results of a liberal, but it's a good reason if you're a lunatic Putin stooge president uh, on Black Friday or Black Thursday or whatever they called it, passed a, about Black Thursday, passed a bunch of dictator laws that like mm -hmm. single handedly turned your country into a fucking authoritarian state. If those protesters are going to like protest and go in the parliament building, I think that's really good because in that case, they're fighting for something good, the removal of authoritarianism. Okay, so for the next five minutes, I just want to explore your position, okay? I'm just curious now, in many examples. So when Yeltsin fired on the parliament building in the 1993 constitutional crisis in Russia, he was doing it to, pro to protect what was the Chicago boys, essentially, the idea of shock therapy, right? Having the Russians privatize most of the stuff and the population, just like in Chile and other places, really kind of resented that. And so the Duma, which was the the analog of the Rada, okay, in Ukraine, they did not like that either. So the communists, which I assume would be leftists in your view, went against Yeltsin. The United States supported Yeltsin, and Yeltsin ultimately uh, dissolved Congress. He did what the Peru guy tried to do, but the reverse. And so basically, uh, my question to you is, in that scenario, uh, it seems to me that the leftists, the communists, wanted to oust Yeltsin with a no vote of no confidence. You should be on their side, I guess, and against the Chicago school capitalists, correct? I don't know enough about the situation to make a confident assertion. However, I do not generally agree with stuff that Yeltsin did or believed, so probably, but it would really depend on what they were looking towards. Okay, so I'm just confused because I don't know if you support communists, in post-Soviet Russia. I am a communist. You but you are. I'd like to think I am, but I don't think there are a are lot a of communist. communists. Okay, so finally I have some label that you uh, accept. I'm a libertarian yourself. socialist, first and foremost. So am I. I'm a left libertarian. I don't know if which I is funny. A libertarian. I'm a libert I've consistently said that I oppose violence, and especially by large entities like states. The reason last time you're defending was violence by states. I am not defending violence by states. I simply accept that we live in a world where it's still unfortunately happening because politicians can't do their job of no, preventing because Russia violence. invaded. It is not the responsibility of other politicians to magically prevent authoritarian governments from invading their neighbors. They've been doing that so I think all this would human be productive. history. This would be a productive mode. I would ask you questions. 
So do you understand that Putin has an over 80% approval rating right now in Russia by the public, right? Sure. Um, I don't okay. know how reliable those figures are, and I could dispute those figures with others because you are literally criminally penalized for any kind of public dissent against him. But Yeah, but these are supposed to be anonymized. And just to be clear, yeah. for example, for example, the Duma, okay, which is the Russian Congress, has abysmal ratings. It's much less than Putin. Well, he's a strong man. But yeah, I can accept that he's a popular strongman with Russians. Okay. Do you also understand that the Russian public supports this war? Still, the majority does. Uh, I believe so. Again, these numbers are unreliable, but nobody really knows for sure. I'm just going to go with if they do, then sure. I accept the premise. Okay. If they do, my question is why? Why would an entire country support a war that you yourself are saying is unprovoked and unjustified? So in their mind... They are justifying it somehow, aren't they? Because people tend to support their government when they live in authoritarian governments that control the media. I mean, so how, it's all state okay, media over there. The I'm just exploring your perspective. So you believe that China and the Chinese public and media supports Russia also because they're part of a, an authoritarian government, correct? I don't think the Chinese people, the Chinese government is lukewarm on Russia right now. I don't think the Chinese people have very strong ideological ties to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The official position of China is that there should be a diplomatic and a negotiated settlement solution to this war. And right, that, which is a pro-Russian sentiment, but it's not the most full-throated one you could possibly give. Right. India, for example, if you continue with these billion population countries, India has historic ties with Russia and friendship with Russia. So, of course, they would, were very reluctant to, they abstain from condemning it in the United Nations and so on. But of what relevance is this? Because I'm trying to tell you that tacitly, countries with billions of people, perhaps the majority of the human population, actually are on the side of what I am saying, which is that, and hear me out, is that the leaders of Russia and Stoltenberg and NATO and, and the United States have failed to avert a misunderstanding that- Wait, hold now... on, wait, really quick, really quick. This mm -hmm. is retarded and I don't care. First of all, do not assume that all the fucking desperately poor people in India because their government has ties to Russia are like ideologically supportive. If you go up to your average fucking Indian and are like, yeah, dude, so why do you believe that the people of the West have failed to prevent the bull? Like they would just punch you and take your shoes and you would deserve it. Um, now, uh, uh, even if we accept five billion, trillion, bajillion, million people are all evil, I don't, I don't fucking care. People believe the shit that they hear. Most people don't really think on this stuff that much. Uh, the Russian government makes a, you know, a, a great effort to propagandize to their people. Um, whether or not a, that large number of people agree or disagree is irrelevant to me. Uh, they better put no up or problem. shut up. I'm just trying, I'm trying to establish your consistent point of view, okay? Wait, so when nothing, I go to here, world... nothing here speaks to my consistency. I don't derive my ethics from the, um, from, from the will of the masses. No, no, no problem. I'm saying self-consistent with you yourself, right? You can be like Walt Whitman, where you say, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I'm large. I contain multitudes. But I think that ultimately, if you're going to argue for something, you should have a consistent position. I have not demonstrated any inconsistencies in my beliefs. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand your beliefs here, okay? okay so, so when I go to World Socialist website, org please okay. please just get to the point of it uh, there are I'm tons to of the people point. who I'm disagree trying to with ask me. you a question I, I, all, let, socialists are, are all questions. retards i'm the only non-retarded socialist on earth you're the only non-retarded socialist yes I'm i don't care if every opinion. single one of them disagree i'm asking your opinion nato had okay so nato had a meeting in spain they had uh, basically protesters come out they were all leftists all socialists this was in may and they literally protested against nato because in their words nato led to this uh, conflict by expanding and not listening to Russia's bright red lines. Right. I don't care. Um, you don't care. No. Okay. I've been arguing with these people for like the past 11 months now. These okay. people are usually I'm, I'm just, just trying, fascists I'm to who use it. leftism as a way of optically covering for their Russia defense. It's not optically. I'm saying there are millions of leftists out there, like the Pope, who said that NATO's the Pope barking is not at a Russia's leftist. door. Uh, Pope Francis is not a leftist. No. Is he a socialist? Does he believe in mass decommodification and seizing the means of production for the proletariat? I think he largely does, and he derives it from Christian values like uh, you shall have all things in common and many other teachings I of don't. He's not, yep. a, he's not a leftist. He's, he's liberal-leaning relative. Says you. Yes, okay, says fine. He's liberal. 
fine. So on the Overton window, he's pretty left, okay? He's fine. He's good these, for a pope, I guess. Okay, and these socialists, literal socialists, and the website, and literally everyone I, who is on the left here yeah, in Europe. No, not no, not literally everyone. But it doesn't matter. It could okay, be not, literally. Okay, I'm, it I'm could be literally everyone. What? Where are you testing the consistency of my values? Where is this happening? You're making the claim that you don't like the right wing nationalists to win. Fine, but what I'm saying is your ideological allies and mine, in some sense, which is the the socialist. For example, in Spain, I can go through many countries, but even within Europe, within NATO countries, I'm saying there is a large contingent of leftists who are blaming NATO. Yeah, right. I argue so it's with not that. a completely outlandish thing to say what I'm saying. So it doesn't matter. Wait, it is. There are lots of retards. Everyone is retarded except for me. That's my consistent position. I hold to it with the the grace and temerity of a de of a ballet dancer. Um, but you can understand why that's not convincing to the rest of the world. No, right? I make arguments to convince people. And that's something I'm failing to hear from you, by the way. You're testing my consistency. I will disagree with any number of people for any length of time. I love arguing. It's fucking... It's I enjoy it too. In fact, I enjoy reasoned arguments that disagree with me. No, there I'm are no reasoned to, arguments you, that disagree with me. There's believe? just brain damage. That's it. That's all I've ever encountered ever from anyone, especially other leftists. They're the worst of them all. It, the only group worse than fucking fascists is other lefties who are pretending not to be fascists when they're talking with me. What? No, no where, problem. What, like, where we, is we the inconsistency this. in my beliefs? Where Where do I, I can tell you. I, I, I can tell you the apparent inconsistency and I'd love for you to cure it. I just would like to remark that libertarians have this issue too. Many libertarians think that they are the actual libertarians and these other libertarians are fake libertarians. So I've, I've heard it across the political spectrum. Yeah, well, it's true. But sure. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you think you're a snowflake, but okay. Listen, I do too sometimes. Here's the thing, man. It's that I've heard you say in the same conversation that you're against right-wing nationalists in the United States. And that if they started to take power, you would welcome uh, overthrowing uh, their government. But when right-wing nationalists in Ukraine, for example, participate on the side of overthrowing their government, you turn a blind eye to those nationalists who are descendants of I the actual I don't turn a blind eye. Wait, hold on. Why? Wait, don't take me out sure. of this. I don't turn a blind eye. I celebrate it. Every right-wing nationalist Ukrainian who participated at Euromaidan to oust Yanukovych is a hero to his people. Regardless of their ideology broadly, in that one instance, perhaps entirely by accident, they stumbled into the correct position. Even if they're mm -hmm. bad people, they've been in that they've in that they're they've not champions of, 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 of circumstance, perhaps. I don't, by the way, this is where you and I differ too. I don't think that they're bad in order because they think that Bandera is a national hero any more than I think the Southern people who wanted to secede from the North think that General Lee is a national hero and they put a statue to him. That's, of course, very terrible for black people living in the South because they had the KKK. So looking at a statue of General Lee, who himself may not have actually owned slaves, I don't know. And Bandera himself may not have actually killed people because he was mostly in a Nazi prison most of the time. So I am saying to you this as a Jew, as someone whose family was actually killed by Ukrainians. Uh, and after the war, the organization Bandera started continued to do it. And even so, I'm telling you, I'd rather see people talk about statues peacefully than toppling a government and causing and leading to what is happening now. You think there's no connection between the instability after Maidan sure and the anti-Maidan. There there's a direct connection. Russia. Of course there is. Yes. Yeah, they Russia. The and we're dealing with them now. So, hey, maybe it won't be a problem in the future. Imagine if Russia did never get in, got involved and never even annexed Crimea. Okay. If, Imagine wait, if, if simply... If Russia had never got... Wait, Yanukovych was a Russian puppet, though. Putin was literally giving him orders as a sovereign leader of another country. To remove Russia from Ukraine, you would have to, like, fundamentally restructure their society. They've been a country at siege since the moment the Berlin Wall fell. I don't, I don't mean to uh, in, insult you by, by saying this, but you don't have a lot of knowledge about... You're so simplistic about Yanukovych was a stooge of Putin. And in was. fact, Yanukovych was often... Uh, a thorn in the side of Russia. In fact, sometimes Belarus actually supported Ukraine over Russia. It's much more complex than simply he did whatever Putin told him to he do. He did many okay. of the things he was told to. He was not literally an automaton, but he was absolutely 100% in the pocket of Putin. That's not even but most questionable. Importantly, 
the the look i think the the broad conversation and perhaps one day we'll have a conversation about libertarianism versus statism because you're clearly not a anarchist i think that you're a statist i think that <laughs> you're the guy who is literally talking about countries as if they are people i am talking about individuals and i'm saying that they should look at the idea of a state as being something secondary to not killing I'm, children i'm i'm uninterested russia should stop killing children Yes, and so should everyone else. Great. You are very, thank you. Very helpful. Other... Walking in, walking into uh, Auschwitz Birkenau, and reminding all the Jews and Nazis alike with great gusto that we should all get along and stop killing each other. And then walking out and leaving, and then you 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 see the smokestacks start uh, rolling again. Yeah, see, unfortunately, we need to be a bit direct with our condemnations. Um, when yes, when because you like to come. You like to come in in the end when everyone's already at each other's throats and there's been a genocide and people have freaking died and been genocided. And then you come in and you're like, these guys are bad. OK, see, I'm you're right. right. Yeah. I would have I gone in to Auschwitz-Birkenau and said, yeah, these guys are bad. What is it? Yeah, what, what of it? That is true. I would have. I would have been very simplistic in my analysis while walking into Auschwitz-Birkenau. Can you tell me what you would have, would have actually said, like as if it your I, I if your I was if I was one of is... if I was one of the liberating for like of the Allied people who went to Auschwitz, I wouldn't be saying anything. I'd be lining people up and shooting them. I wouldn't be okay. saying anything. And here's what I would be doing. Here's what I would be doing. If you did, I would... if I was now, okay, listen, so, listen up, Private. If you're in my fucking platoon, I see you doing a single fucking thing with those krauts that isn't borderline war crime material. Okay, you're joining them. What are you talking about? I don't know what you just said. All right, never mind. Continue. Okay. I'm trying to say that I look at what led up to that. I think that we need to look throughout world history at repeating patterns. And this is why you disagree with Chomsky and you disagree with me, because intelligent people in every other area of life look at patterns. That's what intelligence is. You look at what the main factors are and what they affect. And then you're like, oh, you see when you don't do this thing? Yeah, this is what happens. Okay. Yeah. So like yeah, you you walk around Auschwitz Birkenau and you go, wow, fascists really should never be in power, huh? And then you think, damn, you know, 80 years from now, if Russia ever does an invasion on liberal democracy this time, I'm going to support them before they take control of the whole country. Yeah, see that's you. And what I'm saying is what, I don't know if that's you. I was a little confused there. But when, <laughs> here's what I am going to do. I am me, so I know what I would do, right? What I would do is what I told you last time. Put in place. Remember how I told you the insurance companies have seen thousands of cases. The banks have seen thousands of cases. International diplomacy and trade has seen thousands of cases. These are not new things. We already we have know. the UN. The, Russia didn't respond to the sanctions. They're too poor and Putin doesn't give a shit about his people. He just tanked the sanctions, built an internal market, uh, and then kept doing the bad stuff. Yeah, but you keep focusing on straw men. I'm trying to tell you what I would actually do. Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear how but we how would avoid? It have prevented the Russian invasion of Ukraine? There's so many things that you could have done to prevent the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Are you kidding? First of all, let's start with your values. You believe in democracy. You believe in people peacefully electing their leaders, correct? Yes. Okay. As long all as Ukraine those leaders had aren't to do, gay. Whatever. All, the, all Ukraine had to do was wait until the next election. Wow, what a concept. That's what we want in this country. Do we want in this country... Wait, you mean... Wait, like, wait, wait, wait. Wait until yeah. the next election before protesting? No. Again, I want to be clear. Protesting is fine. You seem Even, to take issue with it. Well, I think that it leads, to, there's a, as you can see, it can lead to toppling a government, like in all the Arab Spring countries or like in all the. Okay, so uh, protesting Yemen. is fine. Okay, what about just flat out like removing Yanukovych? Isn't that based? He's an authoritarian. Totally not base. How do you know there's even going to be another election? He literally just tried to institute an authoritarian so government. So you're happy, in, like if Haiti right now has political unrest and removes their government, you're happy. Depends on the government. If the government's See, really it, bad. To me, it doesn't depend on the government. It as depends long as on the government. government okay, wait, hold on, wait, wait. What about removing the Nazi government? Huh? What if back in 1994, a group sure, of like, Jewish Godwin's revolutionaries and, and, and like would-be partisans could have like stormed the... Um, the Nazi offices and, and ousted them. Would that have been You good? know what I'm going to say? I said it last time. You go a little bit further back 
and you make sure that the Nazis are never. You even can't elected. actually rewind time. That's not literally a power. Then why you have. are you rewinding time then? Because I'm talking about what you would do in a situation where there's already an authoritarian leader, as there was with Yanukovych. Oh, there's plenty of authoritarian leaders right now around the world. I'll yeah, tell they you should what be ousted. Do. You empower the moderates. You make sure to li to lift sanctions. I don't want from moderates in charge. Anymore. I want fucking radicals in charge. You, so, okay, do you support the JCPOA, the Iran deal, for example? I support the Iran deal. Why? Doesn't it empower moderates and lift sanctions? On because, these, uh, because it was the best on, on we could get. On these aggressive theocratic uh, uh, regimes? It was the best we could get under those circumstances. And I think it was a lot better than not having it. Okay, but that has nothing to do think, with protest. We're talking about Do you think if Trump law. hadn't come in and, and destroyed that agreement unilaterally with Bibi Netanyahu helping, you know, uh, argue against it, do you think if that didn't happen and today Iran had inspectors and had sanctions lifted, do you think that the middle class in Iran would be more integrated or less integrated wait, with the I'm rest in of favor. the world? I, wait, I'm, I'm fully in support of like opening up relations with Iran and, so and appealing I. to the people there. So am I. And guess why? Because under my value system, right, even though they may have a theocratic regime that is kind of crazy, <laughs> Even though the best thing in my view, I haven't seen anything better, is to put inspectors to make sure that this regime, first of all, doesn't develop ma weapons of mass destruction that are more lethal than the current ones. And secondly, and more importantly, empower the middle class by removing sanctions to engage with the rest of the world. And I would do the same with North Korea or Cuba or anything else. These people want to trade with the rest of the world, even though they're communists. They want to trade with capitalists. Let them do it. So yes, I don't care what their repressive government is composed of. These people will die eventually, probably, okay? So why not simply let the rest of the people engage with the rest of the world? I just like it when good things happen and when bad things don't. If we're talking about oh, what we can do with Iran, people. then the Iran deal was what we had on the table and we can do our best. But you know, the ultimate hope with the Iran deal would have been something more in line with what I would support. Because the idea of opening up Iran to the rest of the world is that eventually the people there would have the information and support necessary to oust the Ayatollah. And that ousting would go a hell of a lot more bloodily than Yanukovych's would, I will tell you that much. I don't think, uh, I don't think he's going to get a clean break to the country he was a puppet of. That's my hope. It could even go, it can even uh, happen gradually, like some socialists believe that you can vote people in gradually. I don't think Dude, the Ayatollah yeah. is going to let them vote him out. He's going to be dead, like in, I don't know, a couple decades maybe, or a decade? A couple decades? Oh, let's just wait then. Hmm, perhaps Hitler rampaging across Europe for another 50 years would have been fine. No, whatever date you can move that up on is fine by me empowering the Iranian people to effectively fight back against the Ayatollah and his regime as quickly as possible under any means is probably the best thing you could do for the well-being of the Iranian people. The regime is not so popular. One thing I completely agree with you, I think we are on the side of the people and we want to empower people and have more democracy, more power by the people. So we agree there. Um, we also agree that good things are good and bad things are bad. I know all those other people are crazy, but we agree on that. Wow. But you see, the thing is, you're not saying anything. Yes, obviously, good things are good. But when you self-identify with lots leftists, of specific things. No, but when you say, you've said things like, I want leftists to topple the governments of right-wing people. And I think yes. that, okay. But somehow to you, the right-wing nationalists of Ukraine with the leftists or whatever. No, okay, wait, know. no. This is like some square peg, square hole shit, okay? It's not, a, so this is you getting overly focused on people's moral worth and not what's actually happening. The far right nationalists who participated in the Euromaidan protests in Ukraine may have, as people, had bad politics, but the thing they were pushing for was right. They were pushing for it alongside tens of thousands of regular Ukrainians. What I care about are the actual actions. If Nazis want to do good things around the world, then fine, great, literally the best case scenario. Uh, they don't usually do that, unfortunately. But if they wanted to, I would support them. Um, and likewise, there are people who are individually who good who support statement. monstrous things. I happen things. to agree with what you said. Go ahead. Sorry. No. And it goes the other way with good people supporting monstrous things. It's about outcomes. So in this case here, you know, I, I, this is a fully coherent ideology. When it comes to revolutionary action or like um, 
toppling governments or whatever. Yes, I think it would be okay to topple the Iranian government. It's not democratic at all. It's incredibly How about not toppling and preserving, as you said, stability, which is your... No, 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 no. Stability is only good if the thing that's stable is good. If you're stabilizing bad things, then it's bad. And who decides what is good or bad? You do? Yes, correct. It's an ethical position that I hold and will argue for. But I think yeah, most but people would agree. Could, wait, uh, wait, 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 stop. Asked. Hold on. Stop pretending that you're an ethical nihilist. You've already agreed you don't like the I'm Nazis. not an ethical nihilist. I just simply think that others should have access to your brain and your method of deciding what's good or bad, shouldn't they? Do Independently I really need of to your explain oral... why the Ayatollah is bad? Dude, bad, good. This is what I'm talking about. No, it you, no, it's not. You're not talking about ethics. That's the problem. No. Bad and good is what I'm uh, Okay, comma. This is what I'm talking about. This black and white, Christian versus Muslim. Okay, hold on. Wait, good. really quickly. This is the thing really that quickly. leads to okay, work. Wait, really quickly. Which, I'm sorry, I, I, we need to keep pulling this, okay? You said you literally lost family in the Holocaust, correct? Yes. Okay, you are now talking with an SS member, okay? They're part of the Schutzstaffel, all right? It's the, it's the guy who was in Inglorious Bastards with the white beard, okay? He's got like a what little luger on his side. Yes, okay, it's not now. you're yeah. talking directly to this person now, okay? Uh, he's got a little luger. He talk, he does a little German tihi, you know, the way that, that, that he did in the movie that know. everyone saw. Okay, I didn't if see you, the movie. You, you now have to talk this guy out of his own behavior because every second this guy walks a bit, okay, he's going to be finding Jews in basements, all right? So let's talk with this guy. This is now the hypothetical conversation we're having. Okay, so you were claiming... Who even knows what's good or bad? Is that it? Was that what we were no, on? No, I was not. What I'm saying to you is your claim to unilaterally decide what's good and bad is not good for actual policy. Because okay, no he one just said that to you. Okay, to wait. Uh, yeah, um, meine Freunde, uh, your, your, uh, your piggish Western arrogance in saying this is bad, he says, he's grabbing a Jewish guy out of a basement. This is not conducive to good behavior. I don't know how you look with that mustache right now, but I'd love to see uh, the video later. Can I've got a full beard. Video? Uh, it's it's uh, safe. It's safe for me to do it. Do you do you oh, yeah, understand the issue here? Like the world, dude. I'm trying. I'm really trying to like both understand you and get through to you. Um, I don't know which to do because I, which one to aim at first. Uh, so now I'm supposed to react to a hypothetical Nazi that I'm talking to in 1940. You are you are arguing for like a kind of total moral relativism. Where... No, I am not. I am okay. simply saying your moral decisions you are self-proclaimed to be from your own brain and every other leftist is an idiot. So if that's the case... Yes, it's a recurring all, feature of my streams. All, the, first of all, if, if uh, every other leftist is an idiot, why would you want these leftists to topple governments if they're all idiots and that's, they're not... That's actually a good question. No, no, no. You actually hit on the nose on that one. I struggle with that sometimes. You know, it's, it's, oh Finally. yeah, revolutionary gotcha. partisans one day, and the next day all these fucking MLs are out here doing fascism 2.0, except with red flags. You're that lefties. Apparently he disdains you. No, I'm just kidding, man. You have a great fan base. I'm just, I, I don't understand you, man. I mean, on the one hand, you're no, saying all these I, things. Wait, wait, you're, you're claiming you don't understand me because I've said I think it would be okay to topple the Ayatollah's regime. Is that really like okay, a disagreeable I position? Punch a Nazi, topple the fascists. I get it. But, but, and but, but no, but, but don't, don't do say it, it sarcastically. You. Yes, that, topple yes, the fascists. No, I'm yes. not saying it sarcastically. You're so simplistic with it, but fine. Let's well, okay, go with but it. Okay, you start with that. And the complexity is, how do you do that in the most helpful way? Because in reality... Do you understand my position, though? It's a little bit more nuanced than yours, but... No, but we haven't, we haven't gotten to my... We have, we have, no, wait, please. We haven't gotten to my you position. Care? You, you don't start. Care. Okay, you, you start at the the position yeah. you start at is um, you yeah, know. See, my I'm, I'm totally no, please, not with please. you. On this whole black toppling toppling fascists is is good. That's the position you start at. But then you think, okay, well, definitions for fascism kind of vary, and depending on what you mean by toppling, like what do you actually mean by that? And what you do is you go into it and think, okay, how do I actually mm -hmm. apply this system in a way that makes the world a better place? You know because all forms of revolutionary violence are not equal at all. Most people will defend in concept, like overthrowing the Nazis before they did the Holocaust. Most people will defend that in concept. Very few people understand the logic why. When do you actually draw that line? Because we can't see into the future in the real world. Nobody in 1933 could have envisioned World War II or the Holocaust in its entirety. They might have seen some signs, some, some indications, but not the whole picture. So how then can you ever make an informed decision on whether it's time 
to engage in revolutionary violence without knowing how whether indeed. or not it's going to happen in the future. Perhaps you should not. But listen, no, um, that's I... how the Nazis won. <laughs> no, that's the wrongest answer. You can't say, oh, it's difficult to decide. Therefore, we have to let every fascist regime just march ahead until okay. we get. So, I, listen, I've seen uh, revolutions and counter revolutions. I've seen the Red Terror. I've seen the Jacobian Terror. I've seen all the revolutions have the counter revolutions that believed, oh, we did it wrong this time. We're going to counter now revolution. Listen, I, I get it. Act ready, fire, aim. I got it. No, it was the Nazis, man. The Nazis. It was the Nazis, man. It was the like, Nazis. Sound clip. What? So no, your no, whole no, no. don't don't what me? Nazis? It was the Nazis. Any uh, the the if the SDP if, if any of the communists or whatever back in Germany had taken over, they would not have done World War II and the Holocaust. The entire World War II Holocaust combo fun package was entirely a product of the specific ideology of the Nazis. It could have been stopped if Wait, you had well, a good okay. I eye understand for that. that. But what about the Red Terror? What about the Great Terror of Stalin? What about Mao? I don't are defend Stalin. That... I I, I, but, well, I don't defend Nazis. Who are who, yes, so who are those? Stalin was Nazis. Sure, probably. Okay, Stalin was 50%. Nazis. Mao yes. was Nazis. Mao. Mao is a fucking retard, dude. He tried to get farmers to do pig iron. Okay, he, dude. The, the Cultural Revolution and the killings were that not was that Nazis? Everything I don't like is Nazis. Can we move on? from that specific no, rhetorical I line Fine, i get you're astute and uh no i know i'm trying all here. i'm talking about here is that you need to have a standard for when it's acceptable everything i don't like is nazis like literally you're great for sound clip like thank what are you, you. if you yes, everything good is if, good everything bad is bad everything i don't like is nazis thank you and we have to destroy if nazis. you approach all potential revolutionary action as it's as like it's equal, like oh well, this could all go bad, so it doesn't matter. That is very, very, very. How very about we important. first try the non-revolutionary okay. reaction? How so the problem is that in reality, right now, the situations yeah. we're talking about have already reached the point of violence. Russia yes, already that's invaded where you're, you're Ukraine. Best. When the, shit has already hit the fan and the, millions of people are dead, I get it. Ayatollah that's when you come in on your white knight and you say, you people must be killed in a court of law and then we're going to execute you triple times. Yes, I get it. Yes, how I agree with the political objectives the of the Nuremberg trials. That okay, is true. We, got we executed all the Nazis and now all the Nazis are Not dead. Not enough, so clearly. Forward. Anyway, okay, so listen, stop. If you want to build a system that prevents so stuff forward. like this from happening in the future. Yes. Sometimes it's going to come down to violence. We had this talk last time too. How do you stop Russia from doing this? Oh, well, I would create systems that would... Okay, what happens if they ignore those systems and just do it anyway? Can we get into that for a second here? Can you... Okay. Okay. okay I want you to construct right now some kind of mm -hmm. international regulatory body or any system at all that could have kept Russia from invading Ukraine that Russia could not have overcome simply by going... I'm just going to do it anyway. Yeah, sure. But before I do, can I read something for 10 seconds? A sure. quote from, okay. In 2008, Burns, then the American ambassador to Moscow, wrote to the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, from the knuckle draggers in the dark recesses of the Kremlin to Putin's sharpest liberal critics, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests. Who okay, cares? so now I'm going to tell you the reality. Good. Okay, the reality is we live in a world with countries and publics, okay? The Russian public, including the sharpest liberal critics of Putin, believe that NATO is being provocative to Russia's They're legitimate. Wrong. Okay, but can I finish? No, no, I heard you. no you've I already failed. No, 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 stop. You've already failed. We've already hit the first hurdle. No, uh, stop. The world. It's the, they, it's they the first. Wrong. They could be wrong. It's the first. No, 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 no. No, no that's over. It's over. It's done. If they can they be propaganda, be no, if they can be propagandized into fighting against a system that doesn't actually pose a threat to them, then you accept my premise. There is no safety net. It's not actually possible to prevent authoritarian governments from doing shit. No, I don't accept your premise. Because they could just lie to their public purely, and manufacture consent. NATO, okay, first of all, NATO is not a purely defensive alliance. Um, okay, they've been I Stop, that. stop, stop. I know you've got a fucking spiel, pro-Russia spiel you want to go on. No, um, we are exclusively talking about threat to Russia. Threat to Russia, which it did not exist. So let me get this straight. An alliance that calls itself 
purely defensive, but yet attacks Libya and also yes, Yugoslavia. Yes, whatever you're about to say, yes, correct. Not a threat to Russia. Move on. Yugoslavia is now splintered into multiple countries because of like the attacks. Look, I understand. Everyone thinks there's a there's a genocide going on. They need to intervene. I get it. Putin said Thanks. the same thing. Look, Putin thought there was in the Donbass. Like he literally was wrong. There was yes, he he lied. He didn't think there was. No, he it, lied no, about it. That. Literally, that's the justification for going into Libya. Gaddafi is killing. We're his not own people. talking about Libya. We're talking. So we're about... talking about NATO. NATO is not no, purely a defense. No, line. listen. We're not. I didn't say it's purely defensive. I said, and this is an objective fact. That's what saying. I claimed that they pose no threat to Russia, which is true. How do you know the future? How do you know they pose because no threat I'm to just Russia? that smart? Can we move on from this? They didn't. It, it, you would have to be your delusional. You would have to be delusional. No, stop. No, no, stop, 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 stop. Military interventions in two areas that people talk about. Uh, fucking Serbia, which was doing a genocide, and Libya, which is a complicated clusterfuck. This has nothing to do with the idea that floating the concept of Ukraine maybe one day joining in with NATO poses some kind of military threat to Russia. It's not trying, true. I it's delusional. I it's delusional. I, they're psychotic. I'm hearing schizo voices are speaking to me from the rafters of my room, and they're telling me it could pose a threat to Russia. But you have to ignore them. We all hear them, and they're all I fake. hear you. So your argument boils down to, trust me, bro, I'm right. No. Now shut up. If that's what resonates most with you, then yes. It's not a threat to Russia. I'm saying if you came to the Russian public... I don't care. On TV, Why would I would care what like, the Russian public me, thinks? Bro, Have you talked NATO to people? NATO does not pose a threat to you. They never will attack you. Now shut up Correct. and stop worrying about Well, hey, that. now we might attack them depending on how Ukraine goes. So, hey, we'll see. That's, ah, that's Putin's which fault is too. my point. Things that could have previously not been the case become the ah, case. Ah, yes, because you are correct. NATO doesn't pose a threat to Russia, instantly remediated by the fact of, oh, well, we could just invade the rest of the world and make ourselves a threat to NATO. Yes, obviously. Um, maybe Russia could what? just not do that, you know? I am simply, yes, Russia should not do that. No one should do that. No one should invade other countries and kill people. Ah, correct. Oh, great. Let's keep let's keep uh, Russia from Something doing it by funding Ukraine. On. But what I'm trying to say is, OK, first of all, I kind of see your point. Your point is this. Look, trust me, bro. I'm smart. I'm right. NATO you also will haven't not... explained how you could prevent Russia from doing this, by the way. Yeah, because all I had the time to do is read a quote from Burns, the ambassador to Moscow. You read the who quote said, before in our previous convo, and I don't care about it now. I don't think I did. I you did, did. And they lied. Uh, who cares? NATO doesn't pose a threat to Russia. Doesn't. I, I don't. I. It's, it's the height of delusion to believe this, that NATO, which has so far done like, uh, one, a genocide preventing bombing run in fucking Serbia, and two, the Libya quagmire, would go like, yeah, for my third round, I'm going to start World War III by invading Russia, a country with nuclear we weapons, have, for no this reason. This is what you have to uh, accept. You're a smart guy, but you have to understand that other people make points that you have to engage with. You can't just simply tell them to shut up. And what I'm saying is, I've for example, engage with your points. So my, my point, like my point applied, for example, in Serbia and Yugoslavia is the same. Serbia gave up. The reason that only 500 civilians died is because Serbia didn't continue to get weapons from Russia and other places. Yeah, because we bombed them with our bombs. NATO. They gave up and they gave up Milosevic. They gave up. They gave up. OK, so so that's good because the rest of the people were not the country wasn't destroyed, you see, and their economy is not in the dumps, unlike Libya, which is a failed state and completely destroyed. OK, I would have bombed so, them more. Yeah, I'm sure you'd like that. Listen, yeah, all I'm trying to say to you is I like to not kill people and not topple governments. Oh, great. You, well, then you should support, like then you should support systems back. which prevent fascists from taking power because they are the ones who like to do that. Mm hmm. Anyway, I think that what, no, I have what you, you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, bro, dude, bro. Um, can you? Here's my question. How do I get my foot to stop hurting? Um, maybe stop stubbing your toe over and over deliberately against the wall. Got uh -huh. it. So by eliminating anyway. all fast governments, we're, we're going to usher in a, a, a time of peace because, oh, wait, Stalin was a fascist and Mao was a fascist. Yes, on, correct. On I don't know why you keep going back to them, by the way. You've gone back to them as much because, as I've gone because back Because there's Hitler. literally, I don't know who, who is an approved person Stop by you. Stop asking about approved people and start directly addressing stuff we I throw everybody. And you're a libertarian, sure. Yeah. St Stop. Who is, just oh, my beliefs, my positions. 
your position. Okay. What about what I'm saying? Can I say something now? I've been listening to your positions. Well, can I, can I get I some way of preventing Russia from having done this? Oh my God, it's been two hours. This happened again. This happened. You prevent time. Russia from having done this 20 different ways. You allow, for example, if Putin had applied to NATO when he first wanted to in 2001 and NATO would have accepted him, boom, the whole thing is solved, right? Okay. That's well, what... okay. Well, we didn't want him in our club. Yeah. Why? Because he's smelly. What else could we have done? Yeah. You're so flippant, man. No, it's just like, thank you for your advice. So are you saying then the best thing that we can do to prevent fighting is to invite as many countries as possible into NATO? One of the things we could do is require our elected leaders to do their job and to do it in the open and not behind closed doors. So when Gorbachev got the promises from NATO not to expand, I would have required them they to weren't sign that. Promises, they were not signed into paper. Also, Why I not? want NATO to expand. Why not? Why not? Because Gorbachev is retarded. What do you mean? He didn't get him on paper. Okay, so now we've got two retarded situations. Yes, they're, they're all, all retarded situations. You can't yes, base foreign policy based on promises that aren't written down. How does that... Well, like, oh yeah, our treaty specifies X, but also this incredibly damning bishop of the document. Well, that's that we just like said that at a meeting. Yeah, you know, that just got I, said. I think your tagline is almost very smart. Your tagline is politics is dumb, but it's really important, right? So I would make a small adjustment to that. Our politicians fail us, and then we go to die for them, and they don't stop even... with this fake anti-statism. You are a statist, okay? This isn't clever. Thank uh -huh, you for your yeah, incre with your incredible wisdom of. Dude, what if like we just didn't like do wars? Thank you. Well, a war is what happening. What about like uh, if like Putin actually applied to NATO? Like, what he, about that? That happened twenty years ago. Is that seriously your advice? Is that your wise? To NATO. Zelensky applied to NATO. Finland applied to NATO. Russia did not. What, then what are we I'll talking this, about? Though. I'll tell you this: the USSR. No, stop! No, NATO. stop running around. Okay. None what? of this means anything. You, you are, to you are, you are the kind of guy who contributed to the environment that let your relatives die. You know why America didn't get involved in World War II earlier? Because pseudo uh, anti-interventionist xenophobes called the America First Movement, along with their allies, made a deliberate effort to gum up the works of Ameri American military intervention. And we did so with low IQ, fucking pseudo anti-interventionist language like, you know, the Nazis are doing some bad stuff over there, but, uh, you know, would we really not worsen the problem? What happened the last time we got involved in a European war? It's not our business. Maybe we should focus on our own people. You have no fucking right to talk about keeping people from getting hurt when you laugh at the idea that we should keep fascists from taking government. You chuckled at that. That was like a joke. Oh, the, what an outlandish suggestion. The ideology that is the bedrock of mass murder uh, maybe we shouldn't let them in? Russia is fascist. Yanukovych was a puppet for fascists. Ukraine today, defending itself right now, isn't. It's a liberal democracy, in spite of the heinous anti-democratic claims you've made, where they were apparently unable to enfranchise millions of people because of a, what? Russian invasion. You are contributing to the problem. You may think you're doing it because you're anti-statist. In reality, I think you're anti-action. I think you want to analyze frameworks and sit back and condemn every imaginable real world thing can, that can be done. You, you, you only, you, you criticize me for showing up after things have happened. That's how all time works. You always show up after things have happened. It's not possible to show up before things happen. You always get there at the moment you get there. And it's so, frustrating to talk with you because I genuinely enjoy these conversations, but it's like, fuck you. Like we can't, I would enjoy these conversations. And by the way, I've listened to you for three minutes. I think I deserve That's true. one. No, you know, that was fair of you. Thank you. That was very kind of you. Sure. No, I, I think this mode is great. If you let me talk for a little bit too. Look, uh, I'm not going to bring up the victim blaming card or the fact that you just said what you said uh, or any you of that. You can bring it up. Look, I'll defend those statements. These aren't yeah, your, the that, personal I, I'm tragedy. Interested no, 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 no. The personal tragedies of your family did not happen in a vacuum. They are a product of decisions and systems. But I think I get we have speak, a, a right? responsibility to, to prevent from happening again. Might, right. But I think I, especially as a descendant of people who were killed in the Holocaust, get to at least say some words from my perspective, right? Without getting interrupted 10 seconds in every time. That sounds so like a but I'll allow it. 
All right. All I'm trying to say to you is, man, is that more you know things in heaven and earth that fit in your philosophy, which is, by the way, a very simplistic philosophy. Good things are good. Bad things are bad. Nazis are bad. Fascists are bad. Mm -hmm. I call these people fascists. I am smart. These leftists are idiots. I decide who's a fascist, and therefore I decide whether a specific destabilization of a country is good or bad, depending on what I think. Even if the Russians were wrong about NATO expansion, which is the majority of all their leaders, even if they're wrong, you have to deal with them because that is what they believe. And that is what happens. When a couple goes into a therapist's office, one of them could be totally wrong, but you have, in order to saw, save the marriage without you know, violent things and the divorces and whatever, you can do it. But you have to actually listen with empathy to the other person's, let's say, sec legitimate security concerns. You think they're not legitimate. You say, get over yourself. You, we're never going to invade you. Just shut up. Shut up. Just shut up. Shut up. Great song, by the way. But the thing is, like, at the end of the day, though, that is a terrible way to prevent conflict. So your whole thing is you're going to come in after the conflict and be like, ah, they killed your family. Now shut up and sit down. Let me tell you what you could have done. And what I'm telling you, you know, try saying that to some other people. But anyway, what I'm trying to say to you is this, is that we are currently before the Taiwan conflict. We are currently before another flare up in Nagorno-Karabakh. Things are developing. And guess what we have? Intelligence. Intelligence means looking at patterns and seeing what works and what doesn't. You seem to only care about one thing. Let's topple Nazis. Okay, but what about everything else? And you're telling me I don't have solutions? Man, look me up on Google. I've worked for 10 years building nonviolent solutions, which I could talk about some other time. And it's a completely different subject and you would be less triggered and you'd love it. But yes, I am a tech bro. And you know what tech does? One thing it does online, people don't kill each other online. Or if they do, they say, kill me again because I got fragged in Quake or whatever. Yeah, I'm old, so I liked Quake. But the point is that yes, you can do a lot of things online which result in um, dispute resolution and collaboration and getting things done without anyone ever getting hurt. I would like more of that. I would like more of the internet and what we're doing now and an alternative to the media, which is top down, radicalizes people, the state, which you think I am for, which top down gets people into the army to kill each other. And these politicians never even so much as come next to the battlefield. So yeah, I am a libertarian. I do actual nonviolent solutions to things. I've spent 10 years doing it. You've been talking, I've been building it and that's fine. I can talk about that. But at the end of the day, there are solutions and I'd love to tell you about them some other time. But this time I'm telling you that your solution of going in and, and killing some Nazis may solve something, but it's not going to prevent. My solution right now is to continue the existing US policy of funding Ukraine in its defense against the Russian invasion. It is a working policy. It is not impractical. You are not the person to make those claims against me. And by the way, as per your marriage counseling analysis, no marriage counselor would, after bringing two people in, one of whom had just smacked the other, encourage both of them to get over themselves and ignore it for the, you know, for the possibility of future peace. Um, if oh, you... that would be more like if a wife smacked the shit out of her children and say, well, it's her children, she could totally smack them. And then the husband smacks the wife and goes, well, no, you can't do that because the wife is sovereign and she can smack her children, but you can't smack the wife. First of all, no, you be... can't smack the wife just because she smacked the children. The smacking the children is an autonomous... Or nobody separate... should be smacking anybody, of course. Yeah, but that I'm would be great. Control. Except Ukraine didn't smack anyone. The Donbass, Again, you... No, the Donbass mom, was invaded by... Right, right now... <clears throat> Tell me right now one bad thing they did in the Donbass that wasn't a product of the Russian invasion. This Sorry, is what? you being a statist. You are as effective a regurgitator of Russian propaganda as people who get paid for it. And you talk about Dude, tech the bros being apolitical. Said, Dog, the two school? biggest tech bros in America are Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. A fucking Republican Party stooge and the origin point of tech bro fascism. I will defend technology all day, but not the, this. The, the point no, of this discussion technology is good. The minds of people who create it are fucking broken. You are not capable of understanding that these problems are beyond being fixed with an I app. 
I am against Elon Musk owning privately a public forum. I'm against Zuck owning publicly a private forum. Yeah, what Zuckerberg systems would you put in place to keep them from doing that? Oh, that's very simple. And we could have hours of discussion, but the, the, the short answer is open source systems, bro. Linux, Wikipedia, uh, WordPress. Dog, um, open source technology doesn't stop the centralization of user uh, engagement with specific websites. This is exactly what I mean. Monitor, the buddy. correct answer is legislation and trust busting. There was one yes. answer. What You're such a tech bro, dude. Open Wait, source? Trust busting by whom? A centralized government? Yes, busting centralized by our government. I said today, what would you do to prevent this stuff? We live in a state, yes. I do it. I don't have to say what I would do. I have been doing it. I have 10 million users around the world. I just don't talk about it because I you... think that honestly, I'd love to have a discussion on substance. But what I'm trying to tell you is, you want to know what I do? I build open source software to disrupt big tech. The same guys that you don't like, I am telling you, the problem is private ownership, capitalist ownership of public forums. Yes, it's bad. People should be able to have software that they do what they want with, including the media. The media that tells you everything that you're regurgitating and then tells you the opposite is Putin's agenda. If you go to another no, country, you, do, you keep equating Ukraine and Russia. You make Ukraine sound like the worst Forget of the two. Ukraine a husband Russia, hitting his wife, in my opinion, is probably not as bad as a wife hitting the kids. Kids are kids. I don't know. That's variable. So Okay, so Ukraine... Uh, Ukraine hasn't hit Ukraine. anyone. They got invaded. Yes, after that. Okay. After what? Anyway. After the anti-Maidan protests. The citizens rise... So wait, hold on. There's some equivocacy here between the citizens of Ukraine having a protest and Russia invading. Whoa, actually, wait, I have a, I have a question for you. Very important question. In the anti-Maidan protests, whose side would you be on? The protesters who protested against, they were the anti-revolutionary, right? Against the revolution of dignity or the people cracking down on them with force, the, the police. They, who should, are you? they shouldn't be, cra wait, the police cracked down on them? Yes. After, oh, after, yes. after, oh, sorry, not Zelensky, after um, Yanukovych would have announced it. Um, I support the right to freedom of protest. They should so be allowed you to protest. Support the anti Maidan protesters. They should be allowed to. They should never win. All manner of violence should be employed if they have even a slight chance of actually taking over the government. But as long as they're just, just expressing. Just out of curiosity, what makes the anti Maidan babushkas or whatever way worse than the. Uh, the young, uh, ideologically bent neo uh, right right wing nationalists because they were that... supporting the guy who was trying to turn their country into an authoritarian puppet of Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you, and that's the main factor in your mind for everything. Ye yeah, yes. When it comes to my support for protests, they tend to be dictated by what the protests are about. At least there's one in here, and I understood your your kind of your point of view. It's a bit simplistic, but it's essentially no, well, it's, it's, it's one protest like is for good and one protest is for bad. It is simplistic. I agree. The facts at hand are simplistic. So like Poroshenko, a future president who was not a stooge of Russia, in your mind was good because he's not a stooge of Russia, the end period, correct? Oh, no, you can be bad. The Ukrainians didn't like him either. You can, they thought that he was corrupt also. You can and be by the bad. Way, I, I, I don't know how we keep having these talks on like comparative. No, it's just you can be bad complex. and not be a stooge of Russia, okay, but he so, was so better Zelensky, than Yanukovych. The current president is good, correct? He's good in your mind. He's good or bad or what? For me, Whatever. whether something is good or bad is really framed in what the options are. So okay, for, so the options for, were, okay, so the options were he explicitly ran on a platform of implementing the Minsk agreements and peace with Russia. No, stop, like, stop, no, stop, retarded already. You almost had a point. Stop. No, when I say with what the options were, what I mean is like, um, I may take issues with a politician like Zelensky, for example, who is not the best guy in the world, but he's a lot better than Ukraine being controlled by Russia. So I will, I will say Zelensky is good, like in quotation marks, you know, uh, because it is preferable to Russia. Because that, in reality, that's the only real choice we get. You only I get options. He's a smart, fun guy. He's great. But my point is he ran on a platform of peace with Russia. Do you support that? This was before 2022 invasion. This was well, the, the, the people man, party. Did Russia keep invading during that whole he time? Would have, look, he would have, according to his mandate, the mandate was to make peace with Russia. Explicitly, that was what he ran on. At what okay? 
cost? I, well, obviously there had to be a finite cost. No, and clearly. He no, there does. Wait, no, there doesn't have to be a cost. You don't have to lose land. It doesn't, everything has a cost. Sometimes you actually, it's not a zero sum game. Sometimes you actually do get a, just a big dub. Russia yeah, never abided by the mix protocol. So like, for example, the uh, right wing groups that he approached, including the Azov Battalion and Dnipro and others, they were not happy with this because they had been fighting the separatists for this whole time. And by the way, it's not just Russians they were fighting. Separatists did have their own fighters too. And these Who were armed and backed and funded by the Russians, yes. Sure, but they wanted to secede. Yeah, I don't know them. if you support that or not. Yeah, I don't I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. They, their whole bit is like, you yeah, let me go to war with my it. country so that I can have the glory and honor of joining with Russia. Please. Dude, I don't they don't want to join with Russia. They want it to be independent. Right, as a tiny favorite. sliver of land in between the land hungry Russia that was arguing they weren't a real country and Ukraine, the country they just seceded. Dude, from. guess what? That's what Palestinians want too, man. They want their own little state in between Jordan and Israel and Jordan isn't of... fighting over Palestinian land for one. And for two, yeah, I agree. It's actually pretty unrealistic. This is one of the reasons why I've leaned more towards a single state solution. Not because it's the most satisfying end, but because I don't think logistically that Palestinians would be able to do anything other than starve out after being cut off from Israel. It sucks, but it's it's just a it's 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 like you know you work with the you work with the tools you got. But no, I agree on that point. I don't think the Donbass ever had a chance as like an independent. By the way, I, I'm just uh, I just wanted to say I wonder what your chat is saying right now about you and your view of that. Uh, but nodding, uh, look, I... good goal, nodding. A giga chat, oh, single man. state okay. supporters. Look, I, evil, I, in nodding. my solution, I, I wanted to move beyond Russia and Ukraine for a second, just because. Well, we are it, we are on I, two hours fifteen. Okay. I, this is yeah. we just our our conversational chemistry is just too good. This happens every time we talk. Um, I, I don't know if I can run to another one. I was meant for this to be an hour. I haven't showered today. I just. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so I don't want that bacteria to uh, fester. Um, well, hold on. I'm, play... I'm clean. You know, I just I just need a shower. Look, no, it, it's not, it, look, it's not, uh, see, I'm the one who's stinky, not Putin, I guess. Um, look, it's just, in in this instance here, Ukraine. Guys, am I doing better this time, by the way? Just uh, the chat, am I like at least making sense? Chappy mean, to... chappy mean, be super mean. There we go, I've skewed them mean. against them. Ha! And prove my point, by the way, because much in the case with Russia propagandizing to their population, uh, you can never trust anything uh, a, a group of people believe if they're being given unreliable information. This is why you could never have a regulatory body that would do anything um, to stop a country like Russia from doing bad shit. You would need to use military force. So, okay, let's use military force and therefore going with the, what you're saying and staying on Russia and Ukraine because we do have to close this out. I want to play you one clip for 10 seconds. Yeah, this is Kennedy, okay? And I want to ask your opinion, okay? So just to give the context here, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest that two nuclear powers ever came to uh, to a head. Uh, Cuba had been invaded a year earlier with the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, Cuba asked for the USSR for help. The USSR came and put missiles on Cuba, which is in a way a mirror image of what NATO is trying to do with Ukraine, which is to say defend a, country, a smaller country from the aggression of a larger country that just invaded it. So, so then Kennedy's response was, we're going to blockade Cuba, cut it off from everything until, uh, up until you remove your missiles. Oh, and by the way, we had put missiles secretly on Turkey, which they declassified 30 years later. So the point is, here's what he said after he averted the conflict. And again, this was masterful um, uh, dialogue, states, two statesmen actually listening to each other and having a direct line, something they don't have today. This is what he said, and I'd like to get your... Um, reaction to what he said. Here we go. Hit me. In the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Third, let us re-examine our attitude towards the Cold War, remembering we're not engaged in a debate seeking to pile up debating points. We are not here distributing blame or pointing the finger of judgment. We must deal with the world as it is and not as it might have been had the history of the last 18 years been different. 
We must therefore persevere in the search for peace in the hope that constructive changes within the communist bloc might bring within reach solutions which now seem beyond us. We must conduct our affairs in such a way that it becomes in the communist interest to agree on a genuine peace. And here is the main point. Ready? Here we go. And above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Our policy today is in direct opposition and specifically designed to get Russia to have a humiliating defeat or a nuclear war. No. Is it not? We're actually preventing that. The only way to keep Russia from continuing to invade and posture invasion with its neighbors is to crush them utterly. We need to make it so Putin is incapable of serving as a functional head of state for that country. Unfortunately, JFK here is well-meaning. Uh, he's bright in the context in which he's speaking, but it's also not relevant to this specific case because here, Russia is actively expanding outward, invading and threatening invasion and so on. Under these circumstances, the only thing we can really do to prevent the threat of nuclear war is to ensure that Russia is no longer interested in threatening it. And Okay, but Kennedy would have said, just to be, I think, uh, not to put words in his mouth, but Kennedy would have said, NATO seems to be expanding and Russia, the bright red lines of Russia are Ukraine and Georgia. So NATO can take Estonia, Latvia, Finland, Norway, pretty much any countries. But please, let's think twice before trying to welcome Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And then he would say, let's take Russia's security concerns, even though we may think they're not legitimate. They're not. No, no, they're not legitimate. They're a lie. They don't exist. Right, but, they're not real. But, but, we, let's take but, their delusions into account. Continue. Let's take their delusions as and treat them like legitimate security concerns, because that's what people do, because they may have different points of view. And in the end, in the final analysis, we don't want to push them into choosing a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. Well, then it's a good thing we rejected Ukraine's bid for joining with NATO. Yes, it is. So what's the issue? So we agree on that. Many well, people we, don't we never agree. did. No one. Th that's what they did. I don't like. So, so what's the issue? The issue is that in 10 to 15 years, NATO uh, has welcomed Ukraine and wants Ukraine to be. Ukraine has already said itself, it's a de facto member of NATO, not de jure, but de facto. had better make sure they don't consider Ukraine a security threat in 20 years. I recommend they try liberal democracy. It's the best way to keep consistent borders in Europe. Didn't work I well agree. I'm a big fan of liberal democracy. So we agree on many things. We just don't agree on the methods, right? And unfortunately, your way, according to Kennedy, is no. a collective death wish for Kennedy's the Kennedy's statements do not disagree with mine. The situation is disanalogous. Russia is actively expanding outward. There's nothing at all wrong with supporting allies who are being invaded. You say we need to take their security concerns seriously? Well, we didn't invite Ukraine into NATO. All we've done is say they might in the future. We did. Are you really going to let Russia decide not only who gets to join our defensive military alliance, but who even gets to be considered for it? What, what kind of military alliance would cuck itself out by going, oh yeah, here, the enemy, you get to decide which countries are safe from you. It's not, okay, I, I really And Russia think starts saying, actually, we feel threatened by NATO anywhere beyond Germany. And then, oh, actually, because they lie. Putin's government, they lie no, they've and they been lie. They're very consistent in their bright red lines. And even the people that they have served as Secretary of State said this. It does the not people matter. Who, they lie. Job it, look, the, they, this is the entire country we're talking about. No, we're talking about the Kremlin. It's not a democracy. The people who work for Putin Putin's and Putin. The sharpest liberal critics agreed with this part, right? Who? So the, what I'm saying is that 
the people whose job it was to be going to Moscow and getting the ear to the ground of what everyone is saying said that even the liberal critics of Putin, meaning if you assassinate Putin tomorrow and get some other guy, you know, in charge or girl, uh, they're going to do the same thing because and perhaps they'll be assassinated as well. This is a yeah. non-negotiable issue. You do not allow enemy nations to dictate which countries get to join the defensive alliances that were created to protect them from the enemy nation. That's ridiculous. So I think, I, that's, I, I wait, think that's that ridiculous. They, security of Russia. What about the security of Ukraine? They gave up their nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise of territorial integrity from Russia. And did they get it? No. Russia ignored it. They fucking invaded them back in 2014 and then evaded them again. It's ridiculous. They gave them fantastic. nukes. I wish they'd kept those nukes. Russia wouldn't have you're dared. Saying, okay, so wait. Uh, okay. Uh, I just, I, I need to ask this because this is like such a clusterfuck. Um, it's okay to curse, I think, uh, on your yeah. stream. Okay. So I, I try to understand something. Given your own rules, I am super interested to hear this. So given your rules, okay, so the leftists need to win and topple the governments and the fascists need to lose and we can use violence. If it can be, and that's if it can be done, okay. it's not always possible to do these things. They're just desirable yes, yes. goals. So I, I just want to understand how it applies in certain situations, which I think is like mind bending. Okay, so so Laos, okay? So Laos was a country, so we had something called the domino theory, right? Which is to say that communism, which is the thing that you say you are and you like, shouldn't spread, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it was like Putin's uh, neo uh, denazification. So we go 3000 miles around the world. We don't tell our public. And here, let me just finish this. This is important. Um, Kennedy, the guy you just heard, was assassinated. The very thing that you're it. saying, if we do... Hold on, let me just finish. This is very important. If we do that, let's say, with Putin and the next person comes. The next guy was Lyndon Johnson. The, that guy is responsible for bombing a country, Laos, more than Dresden, more than all World War II combined, the United States bombed that one country, dropped more bombs on it. Now, that country presented no threat to the United States, and communism okay. was supposed to be the thing that we're stopping. So you're clearly against that, correct? Against the bombing of Laos, yes, but not because it was about communism. It was just a humanitarian disaster to begin with, along with the Vietnam War. Wait, you're whitewashing... What? We killed civilians. We killed babies what? because of communism. We wanted to stop communism, right? In a country. Okay. Because to send a message, we literally bombed Laos to send a message to Vietnam and others that we will not allow. Like literally, if you go and look on Wikipedia, this was a stated reason. Okay. And this was kept from the US public. My point is this. You assassinate a guy like Kennedy. I'm not saying that was good or bad or who did it. I don't know. But the next guy is even more brutal. OK, and he goes. And so in my my question to you is, uh, so do you support us like uh, the domino theory, like fighting against the spread of communism or was that not real communism? Like what? Why, why are you asking? What the fuck? Uh, we're already over time. What are these questions? Do I support U.S. intervention in Vietnam? Are you seriously asking me this? Why? Laos. Laos. Uh, why, who would support Vietnam but not Laos and vice versa? I guess some people would support Vietnam but not Laos. No, I don't support any of this. Why? Why would I? What have I said to indicate I would support any of this? You, well, you support leftists and communists who were coming to power to overthrow a kleptocrat, which was just like Yanukovych and Laos, right? So you should support no. them, right? What? And you do. No, what? I don't. I genuinely have no clue what so you're you getting at. You support the People's Revolution in Laos. I don't know enough about it. It's it's dead or in and Vietnam, gone. Or anywhere in South Asia. Do you know anything about any communist revolution? If you're so pro these things, shouldn't you know about them? Or Those like communist support or revolutions? Not? They were at their best social democratic reforms through revolutionary means, and anti-colonial reforms. Um, I mean, I know enough about Vietnam. Okay. Do you support like revolutionary Catalonia? Uh, yeah, Catalonia is pretty based. Okay, cool. Do you support Cuba? Those are like basic, like safe bets to support, right? Um, yeah, I think Cuba's better than whatever Cuba would have besides itself. Um, so like it's an authoritarian the U.S. hegemony in but... Cuba, like they did pretty well under U.S. Like you know the Hemingway vacation there with they... Batista. No, 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 no. We're backing off this one. They most no, certainly. I'm did just not. asking. So you supported the revolution in Cuba? Okay. Yeah. Yes.
Okay, and what about uh, Che Guevara and his revolutions? Uh, you yeah, support he was, like yes, he was a hero. He spread uh, revolutionary tactics and sentiment all around the world. Okay, do you support, uh, just to throw it out there, Al Qassam and the Black Hand uh, to support the revolution in um, uh, Palestine, right, against the Jews? Um, no, I don't think we need to be doing anything that's against, quote, the Jews. Uh, no. Well, I mean, they were coming in droves, right? I am a Jew. I'm saying they're coming to escape Hitler's uh, Holocaust, uh, but they're violating the quotas of the, uh, of, of, of the British mandate. Which was, by the way, a one-state solution attempt, right? It failed. The mandate was to create a one state for the Jews and Arabs to live peacefully. That was the Balfour Declaration. It failed, right? So, so what? that's for another time. But I wonder what makes you think it will succeed this time. If the British tried for years under Herbert, uh, and they failed. If you're, like, talking, if you're talking about the difficulties in understanding how things pan out after a leader is assassinated or whatever... I agree it's a yeah. serious issue and it's worth consideration. I don't see what the relevance is, though, when we're talking about Ukraine, which is a sovereign nation with a fully functional government fighting against Russia, a sovereign nation with a fully functional government. There's really only two outcomes to the Russian-Ukraine conflict. It's either Russia wins or loses. It's morally superior that they lose. So that's what I support. Generally I speaking, I will that. support, like my politics are heavily informed by what I believe will lead to a better long-term outcome. And obviously, anything that disempowers fascists will have a better long-term outcome. You would have to dig pretty deep into the well to find exceptions to that. Fascists are I, pretty I, bad. I, I like that you uh, want good to win and the dark side to lose, okay? I really like that. Yes, it and is true. I believe in ethics as a concept. For, for this, I am like the Marvel fans. It is like the, the fascists and the liberals are like... The Sith and the Jedi, and I'm just swinging a lightsaber around. Right. Except that on the other side, they also think that it's a battle of good versus ah, evil. But, that, but, that, but, from, yeah. but from my perspective, it is the Jedi who are evil. I know, I saw episode three. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is... Other people, like libertarians, which you think I'm a statist, okay? I don't think anything I've said here. Uh, you you have literally said you want the state to battle corporations with antitrust. You have said that you want, uh, you know, Ukraine, the state, to remain as it is forever and not have the territorial integrity ever violated and so on. And you don't well, care. Well, it's really you, more about the people that I care about, you know, having territorial... Oh, yeah, the people, except that you said you don't care about the referenda, and you didn't even what? know about many of them. Right? When did I... Wait, when did I say don't you said, care? I don't them. care. Your words were, well, I don't care what the, they... Wait, uh, the, re the people voted to be independent in the referendum. It supports my position. Which people? The they Ukrainian people. of Ukraine in their referendum. Hold on, I'm sorry. Referendum... Ukraine, independence. What percentage of Ukrainians was it? The 1991, 92.3% of voters approved the de Declaration of Independence. That now one? look, yeah, look in Crimea, how many voters? 54%. Yes, in yeah, one very, very area of the country, vote. it was a narrow vote. I agree, Crimea has a okay, lot Okay, so they could have flipped the other way after 30 years. That's fine. Sure. See, in my version, However, the wait, wait, that's not, that's not how the rules work, okay? How does First it work? First of all, 54% exactly? is a majority, whether you like it or not. Yeah, Second back of then, all, sure. it was a vote for the country. You can't just let an autonomous province be independent. And it's not like Russia just instantly assumes control of it if you assume... Yeah, Russia. Should they be independent without Russia? Should they be uh, their own country? Crimea right? on its own? What? And it's subsist Kosovo. entirely off of their fucking goats? Do you know how poor Crimea is? Bro... Do you know how poor the Palestinian state is? I don't, I just told, wait, stop. We're looping. I already talked about how I don't think Palestine could exist as an independent state. Okay, I happen to agree with you. The, but then, no, then would... why did you just say that? If we agree, if I said You're this right. earlier. It was because most leftists don't take that position. I'm they not, the... I'm, okay. I argue Sorry, with lefties more than mistake. any other... Many of your audience take that position, so at least it's good for them to hear this. My audience agrees I'm... with me on most of the stuff that I say. Well, that's convenient. Well, anyway, it is. Yeah. I hope I hope that people think for themselves. I honestly don't agree with anybody, including Noam Chomsky, on everything. Uh, but okay. Um, 
in conclusion, okay, I'm just trying to say there are ways to use increasingly nonviolent systems like insurance companies and banks and okay, international. Okay, commerce. this is perfect. I'm going to engage with this directly, okay? Insurance yeah, companies. Sure. Tell me how that prevents violence. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So someone has to perpetrate the violence, first of all. Okay. Let's not jump directly to, oh, what if Superman and a super country with one guy, Putin, does everything and he doesn't care about anyone and listen to anyone and he has the nukes? Can we just take a few steps before that? Okay. So individuals on an individual level may engage in violence, like stealing your TV. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have that TV insured. Okay. Like you have your car insured. So your car is stolen. So what happens next is that your insurance company, first of all, makes you whole and reimburses you so you can go and get a new car and go to work. Okay, so that's step one, okay? Step two is that we try to make it really hard to get into those cars, and then we try to investigate what happens. Uh, and, and now the perpetrator who perpetrated this crime is typically tied into society. They have a bank account, they have money, they are somehow paying for food. So it's not like we have to rape them in prison in, in, as the only way to prevent car theft. Okay? Well, hold on, are, we're not, Yeah. we haven't quite escaped from the rape in prison yet, have we? Yeah. So Go ahead. how does this prevent violence? It, pre it prevents violence, and by the way, people are more peaceful today than they ever were throughout history. So if you read uh, Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, um, we prevent it by essentially having everyone be richer so they don't have to steal, first of all, have enough food, have Maslow's needs met. You'll find most people like that. Secondly, we have consumerism and the internet and porn. So people stay at home and oh, jerk no, off. No, wait, and no, no, wait, wait, wait. You said insurance companies, not, okay, I know that sure. people are more peaceful than before. Tell me specifically how insurance companies prevent violence. Let's, let's say, let's say one, let's say one guy like assaults another person. Like what, right. what, what nonviolent system could you Assaults use? Assaults happen every day. Um, in New York City, the, there's too many prisons, so it's a revolving door. So you get, so you, okay, in your system, right? People get, get go, let go, because there's not enough uh, No, no space just tell them. me, you, you said right. violence nice could be prevented, so I took this to assume. I'm not saying it will be reduced to zero, just to be clear, right? Don't argue against a straw man. I'm saying simply that increasingly, as we use um, interconnected systems- okay. of I am talking about a specific- wages, Right. Okay. So, so, okay. So a court, so a court uh, or an arbitrator uh, decides between two people. One says, I have been assaulted. The other person says, I have not assaulted you. So then the court, I, and we're talking about, I'm a tech bro, right? So it would decrypt the video evidence because there would be cameras, encrypted cameras that you could not decrypt without a due okay. process. Let's, let's say it was proven. Person A assaulted yeah. person B with video evidence. Okay. So the video evidence was subpoenaed in court. The keys were produced. They decrypted the video. They realized that, in fact, one person version was more correct than the other. Okay? So at that point, the person who perpetrated the assault, let's say the, there's degrees of assault. There's first degree, second degree, etc. They would suffer a monetary po uh, penalty, first of all. That monetary penalty could be a percentage of their entire wealth. So they can't do it many times. They'll be going to become uh, extremely poor. That's one example. Now, if the uh, assault is so severe that a person has been permanently injured, disfigured, they would have to pay reparations to this person, first of all. They might have to pay their family or punitive damages. But what I'm saying is, an eye for an eye, the whole world goes blind. There are other things you can do in 99% of cases. Okay. There are some so cases, I'll, I'll grant you, that you must do violence to the person who so, did the violence. Yeah, I so agree what, with you. what happens then if the guy is ordered by the court to pay money yeah. and does not do it? He's just like, his, no, fuck you, and he you doesn't garnish, do it. Great, you garnish his, his wages from his bank. With the power of the state. It doesn't have to be a state. In your mind, everything has to be centralized. You're, you're the you're, state. Wait, you're giving private corporations the right to independently decide? Who's the courts then if it's not the state? Okay, never mind. I don't, I don't even want to get, I don't even want to get into the end cap shit. Um, so but we okay. already live in that world. Uh, the insurance companies are independent. They're not, there's no monopoly on force with insurance companies. The insurance they companies, wait, they, the insurance companies can't garnish wages from your bank account without- The banks do. 
No, actually, that's not true. No, no, because... wait, no, 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 wait. They absolutely need approval from the state. Or at the very least, if they act inappropriately, you can go to the state with a claim for it because otherwise they're stealing. Okay, so just to be clear, okay, there is a body of law, like the New York Convention. No, wait, 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 wait stop. Okay, I take the L on that. Okay, I don't care. We're just fucking another of the infinite fractal. Okay, if a guy does not, if a guy do? does not pay the wages the court orders him to. Right. Let's say, um, let's say he's already withdrawn the money, so it can't be directly withdrawn from his account. He has it on his person. There is no way out of this without eventually one, die, one day you have to arrest or kill the guy. Um, yes, that's, there is. That's, that, no, that's always the end game. First, um, of all, first of all, just to be clear, you're painting yourself in such a tiny exception corner. The guy has to withdraw all cash or Bitcoin, keep it on himself, never participate in society. Okay. And then he can... So hold on. Okay, wait, fuck. So never mind. It's garnished directly from his bank account. And then he shows up at the local bank with a gun saying that money was his because he doesn't want to pay it. How did he get the gun? Aren't you a libertarian? I assume he was given it at birth. Okay, he was he 3D printed it. Yes, I am a libertarian. I don't think you're going to be able to stop the 3D files that are going to be downloaded on 3D printers. Yes. So he shows but up with I'm a gun. Saying, he he had his yeah, money stolen from him. Sure. So as, listen, I just want this to was be a mistake. Clear. This was a mistake. The point that I'm trying no, to get at is at the end of the day, all answer. political power stems from violence. There is no you, other way no. to do power. Everything at the end of the day okay, is Mr. death Starship or blood Troopers. or possession. That's it. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter. Is the, it's not. the fascist of Robert no, Heinlein. Stop, 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 stop. The libertarians as well. Even if you get into an ANCAP system, this is unavoidable. You no matter what, you always fascist. have to either comply with a concession or uh, or or you're you're like a fucking uh, uh, you're taken out. That's it. That's I'm all there is. Mr. Radchek, the, the Radchek, the guy without an arm in the movie Starship Troopers is the fascist of Robert Heinlein's novel. What the, the novel? fuck are you? I stopped he talking for two seconds and you assault me with another. You'll be getting a fucking settlement. Jesus. Um. I don't know what you're talking about, okay? I, I, what I, I do understand that, is that political power is ultimately a feature of violence applied to people. The fascist in the movie oh my about God. says what you said. It's ironic. It literally says violence is the root of all authority and like... Yes, it is correct. That is correct. Yes. So anyway... Um, yes, you agree with him on that. With your mortal enemy, the fascist. You agree with him on many Yeah, Yes, there's a movie character whose politics I don't agree with, but he said a thing that I agreed with. Yes, he also Robert probably Heinlein drank water. Did, did Hitler drink water? Was he a vegetarian? Please Heinlein stop. A stop. Fascist. Please stop. I don't know why I keep going in this. There's no way through this, okay? You, yeah. you are ideologically bolted, stapled, and hot glue gunned to whatever will allow Russia to get away with its shit. It is your ultimate prevailing Russia. ideology. No, they're imperialist garbage, but what no, I'm trying no, to No, no, you say that. They all say that. But coincidentally, every position you have, which are not only mutually contradictory, but also completely impossible to apply, just seem to line up in ways that make it, you know, that much easier to overlook the severity of what Russia has done. Everything is everyone else's fault. Oh, Russia smacked their wife, you know? Oh, well, that's kind of like oh, wow. how Ukraine so, so smacked their we, children. We, we, Ukraine, how did Ukraine Russia. fucking smack their children? By not doing democracy in a part of the country that was sure. invaded by Russia. Ukraine are great. Russia is the most evil empire what in the world. What did Ukraine do wrong? Ukraine, the country, did not, the people didn't do anything wrong. However, instead of voting for the next president like we do in democratic countries, they were encouraged by the U.S. Yanukovych fled. That was before Yanukovych. That was 2013. John McCain encouraged... They were encouraged to protest. Yes, protesting. Not just, yes, but those protests led to a toppling of their elected president. No, it led to the president fleeing. It did not lead to an overthrow of the government. Everything Fine, was carried so on Biden in said, a normal order after that. It, if Biden was not sworn in and he was, and you know, whatever, let's say that it wasn't January 6th, that was January 25th, and, and Biden fled, according to you, uh, or some people who didn't like Biden, that's a good outcome and it's fine because you don't like you the know, guy. You if, know, if Biden was a fascist, then yes, I would consider that a good outcome because as we have established, I hold the Marvel position of good things are good and bad things are bad. Well, I don't think you have any lasting principles. You decide what's good you and bad. You can't on even fathom my principles because they can't be put on a blockchain. I have no idea what decision-making drives your day-to-day -day movements, but it's certainly not one I can perceive. 
I have been incredibly consistent and incredibly patient this entire conversation, and I'm talking with someone who is legitimately perplexed by the concept of ethics. Not even no, ethical theory, just ethics. I am simply saying it's a category error to apply ethics to what countries do. Countries oh, are no, all right, that's it. No, I can't, no. You win, I agree. Also, um, we live on a flat earth. Okay, whatever, man. Anyway, thank you. I think this was illuminating. I understood more about your views. You think bad should be defeated by good, and yes. good is what you say it is, and the yes. other guys are wrong. Yes, that is literally the position of everybody who ever has studied ethics. Yes, all ethical and positions are derived from a person's right. first principles. And you know what? I, I, I feel like the guy on TikTok who goes, yes, you're right. But like literally he asked people like facts, which they simple facts. And they're like, yes, you're right, man. You okay, really no. can't blame me for this conversation when we're having a hang up right now on whether or not good things are good and bad things are bad. No, everyone agrees with that. That's the point. It's a freaking tautology. You disagree with the tautology. You just said ethics shouldn't even apply to nation state decision making. I'm saying there are far more important considerations when creating systems that prevent bad things from happening than the blame game. Oh, he started it. Okay, well, they just kill him then and everything will be good again. What if we put the Balkans on a blockchain so it was impossible to alter their parts after the Yugoslav? Okay. Um, okay. Your, your chat is great, guys. All right. Listen, no, I just, love it. No, stop. You, please. The... I, the the what? ethics are important. We live only in the time we're in now. No matter so what, wait, countries I, I, will I break rules. Sam Harris versus Noam Chomsky debate, and you favor Harris completely, right? Basically. No, he's retarded. What? But he literally argues what you argue. What is he arguing? That one country is good, the United States, in the case of many of these uh, conflicts, and that if the situation was reversed, the other country would just like destroy completely um i'm not I mean? saying like, any of that i'm no, no, saying no, no, that up, right no, 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 now no, no. russia is invading read, ukraine yes i got it i'm go read either sam harris or kasparov you're literally a carbon copy of what they're saying for what for, for believing that the to the timeline that i'm in is real no what? for saying that morality is basically the fundamental thing that Noam Chomsky yes! ignores morality. He only cares about body count, according to Sam Harris. Okay, and Sam Harris literally makes a, a far more coherent co critique than you do. So you should read him, so you can improve your critique. But what I'm basically saying is, he's saying your argument. He's saying morality is basically about good and bad, and intentions, and the role of intentions. And you know what? I haven't guys said have intentions. I've said outcomes. I'm not a fucking virtue ethicist. Wait, so you don't care about Russia's intentions? No, I care about their behavior. Okay, so you don't describe to them intentions. No, like they have intentions, but the ethics are derived of their consequences. I'm a consequentialist. So you don't think Russia is going to invade Europe, for example, because again, by your logic, NATO's not going to invade Russia. Russia's not going to invade Europe. Don't what? worry about it. They're currently right? invading Europe. I'm saying they're not going to go beyond Ukraine. Oh, they're not going to go beyond world. Ukraine, the, the one of the largest countries in the world. Oh, no, their borders will just smash up against Poland's. And that's the fucking recipe for future stability right now. Listen, OK, are you being hey, serious? Hey, or not? I don't hey, know anymore. Do you remember the Holocaust and how it was bad? OK, do you remember? Are we remembering the expansionist ideology that Hitler used to justify his invasion of neighboring countries, and then Holocaust him, was mm. used by Putin when he invaded Ukraine. Blood and soil, reuniting the ethnic constituency. Lebensraum, oh, yeah, more yeah, space. Yeah, as long as Russia, as the nation, is being controlled by people with that line of thinking, yes, they are a threat to everyone. And how do you propose that Russia not be controlled by those type of people? More Himars to Ukraine until eventually Putin commits suicide by throwing himself out of the rooftops. He likes throwing journalists out of so much. And then the next guy is just going to be a liberal, right? No, the, Lex the next guy is going to know his place, though. I see. And mm -hmm. what's your plan B in case that fails? In case that fails. A million dead Ukrainians? If, hey, listen, if it, 
A million dead Ukrainians. First of all, we're doing better than that. Second of all, a million dead Ukrainians. Okay, don't you fucking jerk off over my stream, all right? We're already one hour 45 over. I know Dude, you like to think uh, about stuff like that. A million but thanks, dead Afghans, thanks to America, to there aren't going to be a million dead Ukrainians. I hope so, because glory to Afghanistan in the 80s, there were two million dead of Afghans for the same fucking reason, okay? Russia, you, the evil empire. I know, Ru to... yeah, Russia's pretty bad. Well, thankfully, um, the, uh, the Mujahideen uh, did not have the armaments that we are giving Ukraine right now. Uh, you know, they are not in the same position to win that All we right. are. Well, here's where we agree, and let's end on this. I think, I hope that the war ends soon. I hope that liberals somehow drive the authoritarians out of every government. Somehow. Okay. Somehow. Somehow. Yeah, okay. No, I know how, but you that's for another time. And meanwhile, I will continue to build nonviolent systems for we the people to inform each other on the media by the people, not by the capitalist owners of the country, but the, the actual people. So I think that it's important for the people to have their own systems of open source and not owned by Elon Musk or Zuck or Putin or whatever. Yeah, I am a libertarian and I do think we have the same outcomes in mind. I just think that you have essentially the incoherent philosophy of I'm right, you're wrong, I like good, and I hate bad, and you don't, and I do, and uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I gave you three hours to explain it to me, and all I got in the end is you literally double down on that, and you say, that's who I am, yeah. leftist or idiot. Yes, I <laughs> I'm not doubling down, it's just the bedrock upon which you build literally all normative positions, but yeah, I'm doubling down on on my first principles that it is indeed true that it's good when good things happen and bad things don't so your principles are you are right and others are idiots yeah and oh man of all my principles that one gets the most massaging oh that one i'm more confident in that one than i am of any other i'm not entirely sure yeah, if i'm fantastic. being controlled by a devil Whereas, or not you know like in the in the descartes thing but this this i'm sure of okay awesome man so that's awesome and i will just end by saying I, on the other hand, like to battle test my ideas and I'm open to changing my mind if other people make an actual argument besides, ha, I am me and I'm right and therefore everyone else, including leftists, are idiots. So yeah, I think we are slightly different on our openness to changing our mind and openness to reason. We, so, yeah. we, might, we might well be. I love you. I have to go shower. All right, man. Enjoy Take your care. shower. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. YouTube TOS will not allow me to say the stuff I want to do to my body right now. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, this is the rock. Oh ah <laughs> fuck. God, it's dropped my controller. Oh god. Ah. Jesus Christ. This is this is the this is the fucking the newest wave of Kremlin um anti-western disinfo which is where they they for, compel you to kill yourself <laughs> the jirukari feast on your suffering yeah what's that what's that um the the box that she put his hand in at the beginning of dune you know like will it hurt yeah yeah like fucking uh you put you put your hand in and this just replays on fast, sped fast for the the gum jabbar i'm like <laughs> Oh. Okay, I have to wrap all that up because there were multiple points in that conversation where I started making like irresponsible and not exactly like fully normatively uh rock solid statements because it was that conversation. Um yeah, oh boy, oh boy. I have to I have to clear this up. Do you want coffee still? Yes, I'm sure I'm ending in 5 minutes. I'll read donuts tomorrow. I love you guys. Okay, um okay, what do, what do I have to say here? What do I what do I what do I have to say here? Fuck. Um I think you explained yourself really well. He straight up didn't listen. Okay, fuck. To cover this whole thing, we have to go back to the very beginning of ethics. Uh, okay, okay, all right. So, there are two kinds of positions. Descriptive and uh, prescriptive positions, also known as... Um, uh, 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 um, oh, God, wait. Do we, do we want to go back that far? Fuck. Okay, listen, I'll just summarize this, okay? All right, basically. You got a normative position. You want to make a moral statement about the world. How do you do that? Well, you have to go back to the very fundamentals, all right? I am what is called a moral anti-realist, or I believe that ethics, what we believe to be right or wrong, you know, um, there's no 
empirical, objective, written in the universe answer to those questions. Like we have pi, like the ratio of the circumference to the radius, like that is written into the universe. It's a feature of the way our universe functions. Um, morals, I don't think that's the case. Uh, people who are religious tend to believe in the divine command theory of morality, which is to say they believe that ethics comes from the word of God. Um, there are Kantians who are losers. <laughs> Somebody tells you you're a Kantian, they're telling you they got a little, they got a weird dick. Not even like a small one, just a weird one. Don't listen to them. Um, and then you have cool people, like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, consequentialists, uh, uh, um, or utilitarians, more specifically. And, uh, you know, rule-based utilitarianism, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, right. So anyway, basically, when I say, like, okay, why do I disagree with January 6th, but I do agree with, like, what happened in the Euromaidan? The reason for this is because I try to evaluate the morality of actions or behaviors or events or whatever based on their consequences. So I try not to factor in stuff like what you're thinking, you know? I try to factor in just what is done. What are the actual what are the actual outcomes of what has happened? The outcome of January 6th, if it had succeeded, would have been a fascist coup. It would have been uh, the murder of a bunch of elected officials in an attempt to create instability that Trump would have capitalized on. Um, you know, uh, 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 not good. Whereas the Euromaidan stuff was a response to the Black Thursday um, anti-protest laws. And if you guys ever have the time to read over this, Yanukovych really was a stooge of Putin, and he really was just going to end democracy. Some of the uh, some of the laws here were so bad that even people in his party refused to go along with them. They would have functionally just made a dictatorship out of a democracy by giving basically infinite power to Yanukovych and the police who agreed with him to do whatever they wanted uh, to any. It, it, yeah, it literally it's insane. It's genuinely insane. Which is one of the reasons why I thought it was like really dumb that he kept saying, "We'll just wait for the next election." You don't always get a next election, you know. Um, the, the Russians certainly haven't. Not, not really, at least. Um, so anyway, you know, you, you get at, um, hold on, Vosh, I agree with you, but I'm uncertain about the argument, not a coup because the president fled, didn't Ava Morales also flee? There are two things that make me say that it wasn't a coup. The first of which was that the functioning of the government was not actually altered after Euromaidan. Uh, immediately after Yanukovych fled, there was a temporary presidency given to the next runner-up from the previous election, like the next guy, the second in head of their system. And then there were prompt elections that were totally in line with and consistent within the laws in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, you know, uh, meaning there wasn't an attempt to control the government or even put a guy in power. Those were anti Yanukovych protesters, not pro let's get this guy in power protesters. I can still see people making an argument that that still kind of counts as like an indirect coup, but Again, I wanted to point it out that, like, the protests surrounding Euromaidan had been going on for a long time. Yanukovych's response to that was to essentially legislate a dictatorship. Under those circumstances, I feel like, in a way, it's Yanukovych doing the coup, don't you think? I mean, like, you have laws, you have a constitution. Who's, po like, who's actually doing the coup? Who's actually putting forward the actual threat to the systems at, at, at play here? Uh, you have protesters trying to oust one guy who's trying to be a dictator, and then you have the dictator, or the wannabe dictator. Under those circumstances, I want to be clear, by the way, Euromaidan is also like a very interesting edge case. I don't think most of the time protests or revolutions play out that way. It's a unique situation. Um, but this is mostly like a, like a, a semantics thing. I would have supported Euromaidan no matter what. Um, anyway, we, we were talking a lot about like ethics, or like how do you arrive at these decisions? And for me, it's just the outcomes that arrive, like that is what I am looking towards. And when it comes to building systems to prevent future violence, for me, one of the best things that you can do is make sure fascists are never in power. Authoritarian governments tend to be much, much, much more violent than non-authoritarian governments. And fascist governments in particular tend to be really bad. Um, so systems that prevent those governments from forming are ones which I believe, uh, cause the, the least amount of harm broadly. You should always work on this as like a, a, like a case by case thing. Like always, there's so much complexity at the ground level. I didn't get to talk about complexity with that guy though, because he couldn't move on past the idea of like ethics being involved in decision-making when it comes to what countries do. So yeah, I don't know. Um, 
You guys, you guys get what I'm talking about, right? I am so desperately in need of a shower or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, one other thing. The thing that I was trying to get out of him at the end with the insurance bent is that um, you say you construct systems to prevent this from happening. First of all, I think that's kind of a cop-out. War has been a part of human uh, international behavior for literally all time. The idea that you can create systems to prevent it entirely is ridiculous. What happens if, if, you, if war happens, right? Like, how do you respond to that? Even if you think we could do a better job of preventing them in the first place, you still need to have answers to those questions. That's one. And for two, um, fascist countries tend not to listen to those, you know? Like, really, Russia was sanctioned after the annexation of Crimea. They have been economically bled out. It is very obvious that the behavior of Putin is making Russia like the enemy of the rest of the world, cutting them off from EU markets. And what happened? They just, they fucking invaded anyway. Yeah, fascists have an ideological bias towards irrational nation state, uh, uh, you know, um, behavior. It's, that, it's, they're fascists. They're not, you know, it's, that's how it is. Hold on, are there patches of gray in Vosh's beard already? God, after that, probably. I think he was difficult for the most part, but he got up one good question. Political climates within countries don't just change by getting rid of one guy. He was asking what your plan is for gradually improving the political landscape of authoritarian regimes. It depends from country to country. First of all, if there ever was like a people's revolution in Iran, whatever government they come up with next will basically objectively have to be better than the current one. I don't think you can get a worse one. Um, the Iranian, the, the Ayatollah is just not popular with his people. Uh, that's one. For two, with Russia, I think the best thing you can do is this, okay? Putin is just the top dog of a collection of Russian oligarchs who have enormous political and economic power, who like, what do Russian oligarchs enjoy? Uh, pedophilia, uh, rape, uh, having lots of money, yachts, penthouses, pedophilia, and I think they tend to be pedophiles. Um, now, right now, Russia's behavior internationally is really fucking up their ability to do the stuff they like. Their property has been seized internationally, they're enemies of the world, uh, their, their accounts have been frozen, they're locked out of global trade and finance. Can you imagine being a billionaire and then being contem condemned to only be able to spend it in Russia? Right? Yeah. There's a reason these people have penthouses all over the world, uh, or at least they used to. Um, they, uh, my hope is that, like, I think that Putin is especially crazy of the oligarchs. I think that he is very dedicated to his legacy. I think that he has sort of drank the Kool-Aid on him being a strong man. I think that he, he envisions himself as a kind of like savior protectorate of, of Russia. And I think it's kind of consumed him. He might be dying. People always say this, but it might or might not be true. Um, if he is dying, that would also kind of like exacerbate this, you know, and the rest of the oligarchs in Russia are afraid of Putin. Of course they are. He's incredibly powerful. Um, my hope is that if things go poorly enough for Russia with this interminable war in Ukraine, some of the oligarchs band together and decide that maybe it would be better to have a leader in charge who was not, like, fucking committed to making an enemy of the rest of the world. And that group of oligarchs offs Putin, and one of them takes charge. I don't know if they'd be a liberal, I don't know if they'd be a, a, you know, a Democrat in the democracy sense. What I do know is that they're probably going to be better than Putin because there are very few material incentives for any other oligarch in Russia to decide to double down on being Putin, right? That seems very unlikely. Like, if there was a group of oligarchs working together to oust Putin and then they were like, okay, which one of us is going to be the next guy, you know? Would they choose someone who then worsens all these things, making their lives harder? Like, probably not. I think they would at least, uh, at least try to soften things with the West. It wouldn't be perfect, but, yeah, you know. That's my hope. It'll be those in charge of the state security apparatuses, not the oligarchs. I don't think the oligarchs would literally be the one to do it. I mean, they would be the next, like, framework of power to, to, um... Hold on. Lila Spellwind. Hello, Vosh, new fan here. Hugely loving your content. Thank you very much for arguing with transphobes. I know this won't get read. 
But I wanted to thank you all the same. Much love to everyone. Trans woman there wishing, uh, trans woman here wishing all of you an awesome day, heart. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I read that entirely out of spite because you said I would not. I'm glad you're enjoying the content. You know, I think ending the stream right there um, would be nice. Can we end on a positive note? Guys, there is a lot to be positive of right now. Uh, Lula is making an effort to crack down on Bolsonaro supporters. Uh, Brazilian January 6 was even more of a failure than American January 6. Uh, Lula! I mean, that debate was wild, but you know. And also, we got a nice method in chat. All right, I got to go shower. I've been talking too much. I haven't had any coffee. I haven't had anything. I'm going to die. It's all over. I'm going to die. Goodbye.